going to see hear him on the second panel. We'll bring you there now. Meeting of the committee will please come to order. On Friday, Congress passed a $700 billion rescue package for Wall Street. This was something no member wanted to do. If Wall Street had been less reckless or if federal regulators had been more attentive, the financial crisis could have been prevented. But we voted for the $700 billion rescue because the consequences of doing nothing were even worse. The excesses on Wall Street had caused a credit freeze that threatened our entire economy. The $700 billion rescue plan is a life support measure. It may keep our economy from collapsing, but it won't make it healthy again. To restore our economy to health, two steps are necessary. First, we must identify what went wrong. Then we must enact real reforms for our financial markets. Over the next three weeks, we will start this process in this committee. We will be holding a series of five hearings on the financial meltdown in Wall Street. We'll examine how the system broke down, what could have been done to prevent it, and what lessons we need to learn so this won't happen again. Today's hearing examines the collapse of Lehman Brothers, on, which on September 15 filed for bankruptcy, the largest bankruptcy filing in American history. Before the Lehman bankruptcy, Treasury Secretary Paulson and Federal Reserve Chairman Bernanke told us our financial system could handle the collapse of Lehman. It now appears they were wrong. The repercussions of this collapse have reverberated across our economy. Many experts think Lehman's fall triggered the credit freeze that is choking our economy and that made the $700 billion rescue necessary. Lehman's collapse caused a big money market fund to break the buck, which caused investors to flee to Treasury bills and dried up a key source of short-term commercial paper. It also spread fear throughout the credit markets, driving up the costs of borrowing. Over the weekend, we received the testimony written, the, uh, the written testimony of Richard Fold, the CEO of Lehman Brothers. Mr. Fold takes no responsibility for the collapse of Lehman. Instead, he cites a, quote, litany of destabilizing factors, end quote, and says, quote, in the end, despite all our efforts, we were overwhelmed. End quote. In preparation for today's hearing, the committee received thousands of pages of internal documents from Lehman Brothers. Like Mr. Fold's testimony, these documents portray a company in which there was no accountability for failure. In one email exchange from early June, some executive, executives from Lehman's money management subsidiary, Neuberger Berman, 
made this recommendation. Top management should forego bonuses this year. This would serve a dual purpose. Firstly, it would represent a significant expense reduction. Secondly, it would send a strong message to both employees and investors that management is not shirking accountability for recent performance. The email was sent to Lehman's executive committee. One of its members is Judge George H. W. H. Walker, George H. Walker, President Bush's cousin, who was responsible for overseeing Newberger Berman. And here's what he wrote the executive committee, quote, sorry team, I'm not sure what's in the water at 605 Third Avenue today. I'm embarrassed and I apologize, end quote. Mr. Fold also mocked the Newberger suggestion that top management should accept responsibility by giving up their bonuses. His response was, quote, don't worry, they are only people who think about their own pockets, end quote. Another remarkable document is a request submitted to the Compensation Committee of the Board on September 11th, four days before Lehman filed for bankruptcy. It recommends that the Board give three departing executives over $20 million in, quote, special payments. In other words, even as Mr. Fold was pleading with Secretary Paulson for a federal rescue, Lehman continued to squander millions on executive compensation. Other documents obtained by the committee undermine Mr. Fold's contention that Lehman was overwhelmed by forces outside its control. One internal analysis reveals that Lehman saw warning signs but did not move early slash fast enough and lacked discipline about capital allocation. In 2004, the Securities and Exchange Commission relaxed a rule limiting the amount of leverage that Lehman and other investment banks could use. As this uh, uh, chart, Lehman chart shows, and if we could have that posted, I'd appreciate it. Uh, that uh, proved to be a temptation the firm could not resist. So in 2004, the SEC allowed greater leverage, and Lehman and other banks couldn't resist that and took on more leverage. At first, Lehman's bets paid out. As Mr. Fold's testimony recounts, Lehman achieved four consecutive years of record-breaking financial results between 2004 and 2007. These were lucrative years for Lehman's executives and Mr. Fold. Lehman paid out over $16 billion in bonuses. And we do have the chart now on the uh, screen. Lehman paid out over $16 billion in bonuses. Mr. Fold himself received over $30 million in cash bonuses. His total compensation during these four years exceeded $260 million. But while Mr. Fold and other Lehman executives were getting rich, they were steering Lehman Brothers and our economy toward a, preci a, a, a precipice. Labor leverage is a double-edged sword. When it works, as it did in 2004 to 2007, it magnifies investment gains. But when asset values decline, as the subprime market did, leverage rapidly consumes a company's capital and jeopardizes its survival. Mr. Fold's actions during this crisis were questionable. In a January 2008 presentation, he and the Lehman Board were warned that the company's liquidity, liquidity can disappear uh, quite fast. Yet despite this warning, Mr. Fold depleted Lehman's capital reserves by over $10 billion through year-end bonuses and stock buybacks and dividend payments. In one document, a senior executive tells Mr. Fold that if the company can secure $5 billion in financing from Korea, quote, I like the idea of aggressively going into the market and spending two of the five in buying back lots of stock and hurting Einhorn bad. This action might have inflicted short-term losses on a short seller layman despised, but it would have burned through even more capital. Mr. Fold's response, I agree with all of it. What's fundamentally unfair about the collapse of Lehman 
is its impact on the economy and taxpayers. Mr. Fold will do fine. He can walk away from Lehman, a wealthy man who earned over $500 million. But taxpayers are left with a $700 billion bill to rescue Wall Street and an economy in crisis. Risk taking has an important role in our economy, but Federal regulators are supposed to ensure that these risks don't become so large that they can imperil our entire economy. They failed miserably. The regulators had blind faith in the market and a belief that what was good for Mr. Fold and other executives on Wall Street was good for America, and we are now all paying a terrible price. We can't undo the damage of the past eight years. That's why I reluctantly voted for the $700 billion rescue plan. But we can start the process of holding those responsible to public account and of identifying the reforms we need for the future. These are the goals of today's hearing and the other hearings we will be holding this month. I'd like to now recognize uh, Mr. Davis for his opening statement. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. We have members on this side who would like to make opening statements. What is the position to be today? Uh, the uh, rules of the uh, committee provide that the chairman and the ranking member may make opening statements. We have many members here. We have many witnesses that will also be uh, uh, here to are also here to make uh, their presentations. So uh, the chair will stick by the rules. Opening statements only okay. by the chairman and the ranking uh, member. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I just like to ask unanimous consent that members uh, be allowed to make an opening statement. This is a hugely important hearing. It's the beginning of five hearings, and frankly, there's some. Well, of there is objection to that. The rules don't provide for it, and the committee okay. will not uh, give uh, unanimous uh, consent for it. My motion. Finish my motion. Well, the chair, the chair has recognized Mr. Davis for an opening statement. You wish to make a motion, Mr. Shays? I wish to make a unanimous consent motion that we be there, allowed to there make is a not statement unanimous because consent. I believe there is a cover-up going on and I would like to make a statement. We will follow the rules. Mr. Davis is recognized for his opening statement. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman, for convening a series of hearings to examine the many complex and interlocking causes and effects of the economic paralysis gripping our nation and most of the industrialized world. Today, tomorrow, and in the coming weeks, we will ask some tough questions about the role of investment firms like Lehman Brothers Holding, insurers like AIG, hedge funds, credit rating agencies, regulators, and Congress in feeding the boom that has now gone so painfully bust. I particularly appreciate you calling Lehman Brothers up uh, today before us. Uh, Mr. Fold, uh, a very active contributor to Democratic causes, along with Mr. Janoulis, Mr. DeMuro. Collerton and others uh, have been bypassed by other committees, and I appreciate your having the courage to call him up here today. The scope of these hearings effectively rebuts the simplistic premise peddled by some that laissez faire republicanism and mindless deregulations alone caused the collapse of global capital markets. That is the political cartoon version of a very complicated life and death reality. Partisan finger pointing adds nothing to serious oversight of the intricate web of individuals, institutions, market incentives, and uh, cyclical trends that have brought us to the brink of economic uh, abyss. For more than a decade, all the Wall Street and Washington players engaged in an increasingly elaborate game of high-stakes musical chairs driven by the mesmerizing siren song of perpetually rising housing costs. But when the music stopped, as it always does, many formerly upstanding financial giants found themselves without a safe or a sound place to sit. Suddenly, the phrase, too big to fail, measured only the limits of our foresight, not the size of the all too foreseeable failure. So today we start with the case of Lehman Brothers, a venerable investment house that sank into insolvency while others were being thrown Federal lifelines. One lesson from Lehman's demise, words matter. Rumors and speculative leaks fed the panic and accelerated the flight of confidence and capital from that company. Words matter here as well. Look at the TV monitors. As we watch them, the markets are watching us. In this volatile environment, unsupported allegations, irresponsible disclosures can inflame fears and trigger market stampedes. As these hearings proceed, we should watch the pulse of Wall Street and choose our words with great care. But it must be said the driving factor in the loss of value and confidence in layman's was a financial undertow created by falling home prices and resulting losses on mortgage backed assets of all kinds. And central to that crisis in the $12 trillion mortgage securities market were imprudent policies and cozy practices 
of the two government-sponsored housing finance giants, Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac. We have asked that former Fannie Mae CEO Franklin Raines be invited to testify at a future hearing because that company's failure offers Congress lessons that we dare not overlook. You can't have a complete analysis without looking at Freddie and Fannie. Many in Congress did turn a blind eye to clear warnings of impending danger sounded as early as 1998. They missed golden opportunities to treat localized problems before they metastasized throughout the economic system. Out of well-intentioned zeal to promote home ownership, members from both parties and both chambers not only tolerated but encouraged the steady erosion of mortgage lending standards. When an alarm sounded, Fannie and Freddie, holding low-income borrowers as political hostages, mobilized armies of expensive lobbyists to block calls for greater accountability and transparency. Using lobbying fees and campaign contributions, the mortgage giants brought their way, bought their way around attempts by Senate and House banking committees to pierce their profitable pyramid scheme. The Clinton administration was rebuffed by a Republican Congress, and this administration had no more success with the Democratic Congress in advancing needed reforms. This committee cannot ignore that sad history in our inquiries into the causes and effects of the current economic crisis. But now that the $700 billion economic rescue bill has been enacted, the debate is no longer whether the Federal Government should intervene in the credit markets, but how that intervention should be managed to stabilize capital flows and protect taxpayers. Although it comes too late to help Lehman Brothers, the so-called bailout program will have to make wrenching choices, picking winners and losers from a shattered and fragile economic landscape. These hearings should help mark the landmines and potholes on the path to a restoration of trust and economic vitality. Trust. There is a moral dimension to economics we don't often want to confront. Economics is not an objective discipline, but a political art grounded in certain assumptions about human nature and civilized behavior. As the process of deleveraging unfolds, breaking the economy's delusional addiction to debt beyond our reasonable means to repay, the goal has to be a restoration of the moral bond between labor and capital. We need to restore faith in production, savings and investment over consumption, spending and speculation. Our witnesses today can help us do that. We appreciate their being there. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much, Mr. Davis. Our first uh, panel. Mr. Chairman, can I also ask unanimous consent for our staff analysis to be included in the hearing record? Without objection, that will be the order. Mr. Chairman, a parliamentary inquiry. Uh, gentleman of State is parliamentary. Thank you. Um, in my request for uh, permission to have the members uh, give an opening statement, uh, I'd like the chair to please cite the provision of committee rules or House rules on which he relies for the proposition only the chair and ranking member may make opening statements. It actually mm -hmm. it says just that you have the right. The uh, rule provides uh, in general, the House and committee rules do not address the common practice of opening statements by members at hearings and meetings. The only exception is House Rule 11, Clause 2K1, which provides that the chairman at a hearing shall announce in an opening statement the subject of the investigation. Because there is no limitation on opening statements in the rule, every member of the committee has the right to power, has a right to seek recognition but, that, uh, uh, but the, uh, as a matter of House rules, the refusal of the chair to recognize a member for an opening statement is not appealable. As a practical matter, controversy relating to the handling of opening statements are no normally dealt with by consensus within the committee. The committee has always operated on the, on the basis of the chairman and the uh, ranking member, and that is the way uh, we will continue to do so. Mr. Chairman, Here, parliamentary inquiry. Gentleman of State is parliamentary inquiry. Mr. Chairman, um, I have been on the committee with you for 16 years. I had the opportunity to chair two subcommittees. The gentleman will state as parliamentary I am inquiry. stating, uh, but I have to have a preface for my statement. The gentleman statement. will state as parliamentary uh, inquiry. During uh, the entire tenure of uh, my chairmanship, I afforded as a courtesy every member on either side in every hearing the opportunity for an opening statement. Now, it may not be in the rules, Mr. Chairman, and you have the ability to now reject my request uh, for uh, an opening statement. The but I would ask you, in fairness and, and the opportunity for all sides to be heard on this important hearing, the opportunity, uh, I, I'm asking you, under the ability of, my, uh, of the rules just stated, uh, to 
allow me uh, to present a five-minute opening statement. Well, the chairman notes uh, the presence of many, many members to allow you to make an opening statement and not others would be unfair. The rules do not provide for all members to have the right to an opening statement. There are occasions when members have been given that uh, opportunity, especially when it is a small subcommittee, as you chaired. Uh, but we have too many members here and too many witnesses to be heard. So the chair uh, did not hear a, uh, a, a uh, parliamentary inquiry, but an, a, a personal appeal which the chair denies. We have with us the following witnesses. Neil Minow, Chairman of the Board and Editor of the Corporate Library, Gregory W. Smith, General Counsel, Colorado Public Employees Retirement Association, Robert F. Westcott, Ph.D., President Keybridge Research, LLC, Luigi Zing Zingales, a Ph.D., Professor, University of Chicago Graduate School of Business, and Peter J. Wallison, Arthur F. Burns Fellow in Financial Policy Studies, American Enterprise Institute. It is the policy of this committee that all witnesses that testify before us do so under oath, so I would like to ask each of you to please stand and raise your right hand. Do you uh, solemnly swear that the uh, uh, testimony you will give before the committee will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? The record will indicate that each of the witnesses answered in the affirmative. Your prepared statements. Okay. Your prepared statements uh, will be in the record in full. We would like to ask each of you to be mindful that we have a clock that will indicate when five minutes is up. We would like you to stay as close to the five minutes as uh, possible. Uh, there will be uh, a green light for four minutes, a yellow light for the last minute, and then when it turns red, the five minutes has expired. Uh, Dr. Zingales, am I pronouncing your name correctly? Okay. There is a button on the base of your mic. Be sure it is in, and we would like to hear from you first. Okay, thank you. Chairman Waxman, Ranking Minority Davis, members of the committee, thank you for inviting me. The demise of Lehman Brothers is the result of its very aggressive leverage policy in the context of a major financial crisis. The roots of this crisis have to be found in bad regulation, lack of transparency, and market complacency brought by several years of positive returns. A prolonged period of real estate price increases and the boom of securitization relaxed lending standards. The quality of these mortgages should have been checked by the capital market that bought them, but several problems made this monitoring less than perfect. First, these mortgages were priced based on historical records which did not factor in the probability of a significant drop in real estate prices at the national level, nor did they factor the effects of the changes in the lending standards on the probability of the fault. Second, the massive amount of issuance by a limited number of players, of which Lehman was one, changed the fundamental nature of the relationship between credit rating agencies and the investment banks issuing the securities. As a result, instead of submitting an issue to the rating agency's judgment, investment banks shop around for the best ratings and even receive handbooks on how to produce the riskiest security that qualify for a AAA rating. The market was not completely fooled by this process. AAA rated asset-backed securities at a higher yield than corporate AAA a clear indication of the higher risk. Unfortunately, regulatory constraints created inflated demand for these products. Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac were allowed, even induced, to invest their funds on these securities, creating an easy arbitrage. They issued AAA rated debt and invested in higher yield AAA rated debt. Another source of captive demand were money market funds. Being required to hold only highly rated securities, Money market funds love these instruments and satisfy their regulatory requirements and boosted their yields. Most managers of these funds were aware of the gamble they were taking but could not resist taking it under an intense competition for yield hungry customers. These managers were also hoping that if a shock occurred, all their competitors would face the same problem, thereby reducing the reputational cost and possibly triggering a government support. The September 19 decision to ensure all money market funds validated this gamble, forever destroying money market managers' incentives to be careful in regarding to the risk they take. The pooling of mortgages, while beneficial for diversification purposes, became a curse as the downturn worsened. The lack of transparency in the issuing process made it difficult to determine who owned what. 
Furthermore, the complexity of these repackaged mortgages is such that small differences in the assumed rate of default can cause the value of some tranches to fluctuate from 50 cents on the dollar to zero. Lacking information on the quality and hence the value of banks' assets, the market grew reluctant to lend to them for fear of losing out in case of default. In the case of Lehman and other investment banks, this problem was aggravated by two factors, the extremely high level of leverage and the strong reliance on short-term debt financing. While commercial banks cannot leverage their equity more than 15 to 1, Lehman had a leverage of more than 30 to 1. With this leverage, a mere 3.3% drop in the value of asset wipes out the entire value of equity and makes the company insolvent. In turn, the instability created by the leverage problem was exacerbated by Lehman's large use of short-term debt. Reliance on short-term debt increases the risk of runs similar to the ones banks face when they are rumored to be insolvent. The Lehman CEO will likely tell you that his company was solvent and it was brought down by a run. This is a distinct possibility. The problem is that nobody knows for sure. When Lehman went down, it had 26 billion in book equity, but the doubts about the value of its asset combined with this high degree of leverage created a huge uncertainty about the true value of this equity. It could have been worth 40 billion or negative 20. It's important to note that Lehman did not find itself in that situation by accident. It was the unlucky draw of a consciously made gamble. Lehman's brother bankruptcy forced the market to reassess risk. As after a major flood, people start to buy flood insurance, after the demise of Lehman, the market started to worry about several risks previously overlooked. This risk reassessment is crucial to support a market discipline. The downside is that it can degenerate into a panic. Thank you very much, Dr. Zingales. Dr. Westcott. Chairman Waxman and members of the committee, thank you for inviting me to testify today about the uh, financial meltdown on Wall Street. I'll focus my comments on the main causes of the uh, financial crisis. During questions, I'm also happy to, to discuss uh, its economic effects and also the lessons we might draw about it for, for public policy. I'll give you an economist's perspective, drawing on my experiences in forecasting the U.S. economy, in participating in the national economic policymaking process at the National Economic Council at the White House, and in researching global economic and financial risks. In my opinion, there were three main contributors to the financial meltdown. The first was an environment of easy credit that existed in the first half of this decade. We simply left the monetary floodgates open too far and too long in the period 2002 to 2005. During this period, uh, mortgage rates got as low as 2.5%, and families got an inflated sense of their capacity to afford housing. This cheap credit quickly got capitalized in housing prices, and housing prices doubled and even tripled in some neighborhoods in the span of just a few years. This caused a housing frenzy, and many Americans de uh, developed unrealistic expectations and assumed that housing prices could only go up. The second key development was mortgage securitization, the bundling of pools of mortgages, their underwriting, and their sale to institutional investors. This increased liquidity and made more mortgage money cheaper than uh, because we could tap the savings of global um, savers. On the downside, however, it also meant that the mortgage originator was no longer going to hold the mortgage to maturity, so it did not have a strong incentive to perform due diligence on the loan. In this environment of easy credit, there was lots of competition. Lenders began loosening standards to win business and increase market share. This led to an easing of down payment requirements and a proliferation of unconventional mortgages, including, including teaser rate mortgages, no doc mortgages, option payment mortgages, and so on. Eventually, home buyers were, were receiving 100% loan to value uh, mortgages, a very dangerous predictor of default risk. The third key development was an increase in leverage by investment banks, as has just been stated. Whereas a traditional bank might have a leverage ratio of, say, four, meaning that the value of its obligations was four times the value of its shareholders' equity, investment banks increased their leverage ratios to 30 or 35 times in the past few years. Such high leverage ratios meant that there was much less cushion in hard times. Well, how did these ingredients mix? As long as house prices kept appreciating steadily, all players in the system had a strong incentive to keep going and keep doing what they were doing. 
It was good for existing homeowners because they had asset appreciation and they had great opportunities for extracting equity out of their houses through uh, cash out refinancings and home equity loans. Basically, families started using their houses as ATM machines. It was good for new home buyers, including speculators, because they saw almost immediate price gains. It was good for mortgage brokers. They earned hefty origination fees. It was good for rating agencies. They had great business. And it was good for investment banks because they were earning large securitization fees. The system boomed this way for many years. The problem came when the U.S. housing sector simply reached saturation. By early 2006, almost every American who wanted a home was in one. The Fed started raising interest rates to fight inflation, and suddenly housing prices leveled off and then began to fall. Some borrowers, especially subprime borrowers, began to miss their monthly mortgage payments, and the value of subprime mortgage portfolios began to decline. Now, because of the high leverage in the investment banks, many simply did not have the cushion to fall back on. Their problems were compounded by a rapidly weakening U.S. economy. As the housing sector weakened, overall U.S. economic growth was cut roughly in half, and the, uh, the drying up of uh, home equity loans and cash out refinancings hurt consumption. By early 2008, 10 percent of all U.S. households were underwater with their mortgages, meaning that they owed more on their house than their house was worth. These events set the stage for the financial and liquidity crisis we have today. The cause of Lehman Brothers, uh, 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 basically the collapse of Lehman Brothers in September was effectively the pinprick that burst the bubble. Mr. Chairman, the collapse of Lehman shook the market's financial confidence and set off a liquidity crisis that has thrown sand into the gears of the U.S. economic engine. What lesson should we draw? Any time the price of a major asset class or commodity increases 200 percent or 300 percent in a matter of just a few weeks, or in a matter of just a few years, whether it's home prices, timber, Dutch tulips, oil, gold, technology stocks, we need to ask questions. Prudent regulators need to, needed to ask whether the system they regulate could tolerate a rapid uh, return of asset prices to their historical trading range, and private executives running investment banks who wanted to maximize their shareholders' value in the long term needed to ask whether their business model could tolerate a rapid return of asset prices to the historical range. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Westcott. Ms. Minow. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman and members. Um, it's an honor to participate in this hearing. I appreciate it very much. Um, and I would give anything um, if what I wasn't here to say was I told you so. Um, I've testified before this committee before, and what I said then was that there's no more reliable indicator of investment, litigation, and liability risk than excessive CEO compensation. CEO compensation is not just the symptom. It is actually a cause. It pours gasoline on the fire. With that in mind, um, I'd like to tell you what our ratings have been. My company, the Corporate Library, rates boards of directors, and in part, we look at decisions they make, like CEO pay. Um, we've given this company a C or a D uh, since we started rating them, with one very brief exception of a couple of months where we gave them a B. Uh, here's an, a, a quote from our analyst note on the company. Although the CEO's 2007 salary is well below the median for companies of similar size, his non-equity incentive compensation of $4,250,000 exceeded the 85th percentile. While typical target bonus is two times base salary, Mr. Folds was more than five times his base salary. Additionally, his total annual compensation of $71,924,178 ranks in the top 3 percent for similarly sized companies. Um, as I've mentioned before, this is the problem. When we pay people based on the volume of business rather than the quality of business, eventually it's like a game of musical chairs. And when the music stops, the people who don't have a place to sit are the investors. Uh, pay that is out of alignment is one of the causes of poor performance, but it's also an important symptom of an ineffective board. Let's talk about this board for just a minute. They had a finance and risk management committee. I think that my econ economist colleagues here would agree, and my investor colleague, that the, in a company like this, the Finance and Risk Management Committee is a very important committee. And yet it only met twice in 2007 and twice in 2006. Um, the 
crystal clear explanations of Dr. Zingales and Dr. Westcott were, as, as brilliant as they are, were not unknown at the time. These were things that the risk committee should have been looking at. Um, and additional indicators, meaningful stock ownership by the board. It's a public statement of their confidence in the company and a powerful reminder and motivator for them as they deliberate, deliberate issues like executive compensation and risk management. With the exception of the CEO who sold a significant percentage of his stock and the lead director and the 23-year th veteran on the committee, given their tenure, these directors did not put their money where their mouths were. I'm really horrified by the effort by Mr. Fold and other executives in these failing companies to absolve themselves of blame. I, it infuriates me when they talk about how efficient the markets are except when they're not efficient. All of a sudden it's not their fault anymore. Um, these are people who fight for deregulation and now they're blaming the regulators. They talk about a litany of destabilizing factors. Let me tell you that the most important destabilizing factor was an inefficient and ineffective board of directors and bad judgment by the executives. People make mistakes, but what we like to see is people accepting responsibility and participating in mitigating damages and preventing the recurrence. It's indispensable for the credibility of our capital markets to align the interests of executives with the investors. And we will have an enormously increased cost of capital if we do not make that clear throughout the world. What we had was an executive compensation system that created an incentive for imagining derivative securities that exploited regulatory and accounting loopholes. Uh, I had a presentation at the uh, Public Company Accounting Oversight Board where they told us that Paul Volcker said he didn't understand these derivatives. I hereby propose the Paul Volcker rule that if he doesn't understand it, we shouldn't put it out on the markets. Even if executives are overwhelmed by forces beyond their control, I believe you've heard this expression before, that's why we pay them the big bucks. Thank you. Thank you. No uh, demonstrations. Thank you, Ms. Minow. Mr. Smith? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, members, for having me here today to express the perceptions and perspective of a major institutional investor. One of the things that I want to address, you've certainly heard some good diagnosis and, and comments from people much more qualified than I to assess why this has happened. I'd like to put a little bit of a face to this. We hear a lot in the media about the savior of Wall Street and we hear a lot about major institutions and in in uh, throughout the country, Wall Street being saved. We think this is about every working American in the United States. It's about people that I work for every day. I work for a pension fund that represents 420,000 current and former public employees, public servants in the state of Colorado. We represent every state trooper every teacher in the state of Colorado, every state employee, every judge, and over 400 employers, including all of our local divisions of government. These are the, the individuals are the ones that are being impacted in this crisis. It's the individuals who are having to face the questions of whether their, their college fund for their children is going to still be around when this is over. It's these individuals who are wondering, how long is it till retirement now? How long do I have to go before I can recover from what Wall Street has done to me this time? And what it really is boiled down to is a complete collapse in investor confidence. And it's a complete collapse in investor confidence because they no longer believe in management, they no longer believe in the numbers, and they no longer believe in the regulatory framework for good reason. We don't claim to know, I certainly don't claim to be able to articulate why this happened, and I certainly would not predict what the result of the blame game is going to be. There certainly is going to be one, and the lawyers are going to spend a lot of time on it. What we would like to urge you to, to consider is what the future needs to hold to regain confidence, and what it needs to, to, to consist of is an opportunity for shareholders to be heard at a meaningful way at a meaningful time in the process of running corporate America. We need access to the proxy. 
We need to be able to hold the directors accountable. If they're not doing a good job, we need to be able to get them out of the boardroom and get somebody else in that will represent shareholders. We need a regulatory framework that's aligned with the shareholder, not with corporate America, but with the shareholders and in a regulatory framework that's prepared to hold people accountable that breach their duty to the shareholder. That's where we need to go. We need to have say on pay and we need to be able to regain confidence that this market is about the shareholder. It's about mom and pop, it's about small businesses, and it's about the individuals that I represent all over this country. One of the things that, that doesn't get talked about very much and that's really impacting uh, the people that I work with is the credit crisis and the freezing of their accounts. Uh, people who have been the most conservative investors and who have thought, well, I don't want to get involved in these speculative things. I'm going to put my money in a money market. I'm going to fall behind uh, inflation. I don't really worry about inflation. I want to make sure I have my money. Those people don't have their money now. Uh, we manage our cash through those types of accounts. There were, there were times last week and two weeks ago that our money was on the brink of being frozen. People in this country are not going to be able to make payroll. Small businesses are not going to be make payroll because they're not going to be able to access their cash. These are the problems that we believe are yet to come. Some of them you've begun to see, but there's many more to come, and it's the, the working people of America that are suffering this crisis. It's not about Wall Street. It's about investor confidence, and that, that's what needs to be restored. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Smith. Mr. Wallison. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman and uh, members of this committee. I'm really pleased to have this opportunity to address the question of regulation and its role in the current financial crisis. There are cases where regulation is necessary and cases where it is harmful. It was necessary in the case of Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac. These two companies were seen in the market as backed by the Federal Government. As a result, investors did not worry about the risks of lending to them, since Uncle Sam would bail them out if the companies got into financial trouble. Investors have been proved right. In cases where investors see themselves as bearing no risks, lending to a private shareholder-owned company, strong regulation is essential. That is the only way that government can protect itself against loss. Yet Congress resisted. Mr. Wallison, could you pull the mic a little closer? Oh, some members are having Yet Congress difficult. resisted reforming regulation of Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac until it was too late. And even then, the reform legislation wouldn't have been passed unless it had been attached to a housing bill that Congress wanted to adopt before going home for the August recess. The failure by Congress had serious consequences. An article in yesterday's New York Times makes clear that reckless buying of junk loans by Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac bears a large part of the responsibility for the financial crisis we are now in. Voters just, justifiably angry about the $700 billion rescue plan just adopted by Congress should recognize who is responsible and act accordingly. Incidentally, since some issues of compensation have come up, I ought to mention that uh, Fannie was very generous in its own compensation. Franklin Raines, who was its chairman for several years, four or five, made $90 million during the time he was there. Um, and there was little outrage expressed in Congress at that time. Bad or weak regulation is often worse than no regulation at all. Another article in the New York Times on Friday of last week recounted the SEC's failure to devote sufficient resources to the regulation of the major investment banking firms that have now all collapsed, been taken over, sold themselves to big banks, or sought shelter under the Federal Reserve's wings as financial holding companies. According to the article, the SEC assigned a pitifully small staff to regulating these huge investment banks, and as a result, they took imprudent financial risks that ultimately led to their losses. A chart accompanying the article shows that these institutions took increasing risks every year from the time they entered the SEC's supervisory regime. This is important. It demonstrates the effect of regulation in creating moral hazard. Immediately after the SEC took over the supervision of their safety and soundness, the market discipline to which they had previously been subject began to relax. Investors thought the SEC was minding the store, but it wasn't. 
That's why weak regulation can be worse than none. Regulation itself is no panacea. Even strong regulation may not be effective. Regulation of commercial banks in the United States is a case of strong regulation failing. Congress imposed a strong regulatory regime on commercial banks when it adopted FIDICIA in 1991. Still, uh, even though IndyMac, WAMU, Wachovia, and dozens of smaller commercial banks were regulated by one or another agency of the Federal Government, under strict FIDICIA requirements, they all failed or had to be taken over, just like the weakly regulated investment banks. Calling for more regulation as a solution to the financial crisis is, therefore, somewhat simplistic. Regulation's track record is ambiguous. There is no question that it is the only protection we have when the government is exposed to risks created by companies it backs, like commercial banks, which have deposits insured by the FDIC, and like Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, which were seen as backed by the Federal Government without any limit. But the regulation of the investment banks by the SEC was a mistake. They were not seen as backed by the government in any way until the SEC was given authority to supervise their safety and soundness. Then their risk taking took off. If they had been left free of government oversight, they would not, in my view, have been able to borrow the funds that created their extraordinary leverage. If our solution to today's crisis is to regulate hedge funds, private equity funds, finance companies, institutional lenders, pension funds, leasing companies, and insurance companies, and anyone else who participates in the capital markets without any government backing, we will simply be assuring ourselves of many more financial crises in the future. Many thanks, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Wallace. And thank, I want to thank all the members of the panel for your uh, presentation. We will now recognize members to ask questions for a five-minute uh, period. And we will start uh, with Ms. Maloney. Uh, thank, thank you, Mr. Chairman and Ranking Member uh, Davis and all of the panelists. Uh, we, we are facing what has been called the most serious financial crisis since the 1930s, and the potential cost to taxpayers is staggering. $29 billion to J.P. Morgan to buy Bear Stearns, $85 billion to AIG, $200 billion to Fannie and Freddie, $700 billion rescue package, $300 billion to the Fed window, opening it up to investment banks, $50 billion to stabilize the money market funds, a staggering $1.7 billion potential cost to taxpayers. Now, uh, Professor Zingales, you seem to believe that this may have been caused by the staggering leverage that was put in these firms, but others uh, see it as the deregulation that has taken place in Congress over the past decade. In 1990, Congress passed the Financial Stabilization Act, uh, which took away the protections of the Glass-Steagall Act uh, that had served and protected our economy for 80 years. This allowed banking a safety and soundness uh, standard uh, to be able to merge and be lowered with uh, risky speculative activities. And uh, then uh, during this period, Congress prohibited the regulation of risky der derivatives. The SEC loosened rules governing the amount of leverage that investment banks could use, and Federal regulators were defunded and defanged, and they were reluctant to use the authority they had to protect uh, taxpayers and investors. Uh, some believe that the root cause of the credit costs of this crisis was not only the leverage, but the excessive deregulation. And I'd like to ask uh, first Dr. Westcott and then others if you'd like to comment, what do you think were the biggest mistakes or missed opportunities for regulators? And going, and going forward, what do you think we should regulate? Do you think all of this deregulation that I listed was a mistake uh, for protection for our taxpayers and our economy? Regulation is a, um, uh, as Mr. Wallace said, is an extremely complicated um, matter, and it's very important that it be handled and, uh, and that we get the incentives uh, properly um, lined up here. There's no question that the uh, the regulators did 
make a decision, the SEC made a decision in 2004, in April of 2004, to relax the, the leverage uh, standards that the large $5 billion plus uh, investment banks uh, would be allowed to operate under. And in my opinion, this, this decision did end up um, uh, making the situation worse. And so I, I do What about glass steel, Dr. Dr. Westcott? Uh, that's not complicated. It merely says uh, financial institutions, banks, safety and soundness should not mingle with risky activities. That's not complicated at all. It's very clear. Right. Was that a mistake to roll that back, do you believe? Or, or, and I would ask any other panelists to talk. Mm -hmm. um, I, I don't have a strong opinion on, the, on, on Glass-Steagall. I, I do think that there were risks involved in, um, in the mortgage lending business that were greater than were appreciated by regulators and obviously by many of the investment banks themselves. Uh, the key thing was that they assumed that there was going to be plenty of business and that they could keep getting additional borrowers and that they would not suffer credit quality loss as we went, as we went uh, further and further down the, um, the, the, the list of applicants for mortgages. Thank you. And I'd that just ended like, up being the problem. Thank you very much. My time is very limited. I'd just like to go down the line, uh, starting with Dr. Zingales. Do you think uh, repealing Glass-Siegel, allowing bank to mi banks to mix with risky investment banks where the, where that were leveraged in hedge funds, in some cases 1 to 30, 1 to 60. Do you think rolling it back was a mistake, yes or no? No, I don't think that was a mistake. Okay, I think yes or no. Mr. Westcott, you, you, you don't think it was a mistake? Um, uh, no at this point. Ms. Minna? I do think it was a mistake. You do. Mr. Smith? Uh, it appears to be from this angle. Excellent. Yeah. Okay. Mr. Wallace. I'm sorry, it appears to be from this angle. Yeah. Yeah. Mr. Wallace? Not a mistake. Pardon me? Not a mistake. Not a mistake. Okay, so, so we're divided on that. If, if the Fed and Treasury had not allowed Lehman to fail and default on its obliga obligations, would this have prevented runs on other firms and especially the money market uh, uh, funds, the run that began on that? Um, Again, down the panel quickly. My time has expired. Quickly okay. down the panel. I, I think no. It, the, the proof is if we look at what happened when Bear Stearns was bailed out, I think that, uh, for example, the price of the credit default swap, which is an insurance on default, is a measure of how um, wh whiskey uh, borrowers are considered, went up the same amount that went up after the Lehman default. So I don't think that uh, bailing out sort of Lehman would have uh, resolved the situation. I think that regulators, in retrospect, would, uh, would, would now understand that there was more Lehman paper out there in money market accounts, and they might have made a different decision on that, on that account. I, I, I think it would not have made an enormous difference. I think it was one, one piece of a much bigger puzzle. Yes, no significant difference, I think. Mm -hmm. Thank, Thank you, Ms. Thanks. Maloney. Uh, Mr. Davis? Um, thank you. Uh, this concerns the SEC. <clears throat> Both the Chairman and I uh, were instrumental in shepherding through legislation that removed the civil service pay ceilings on the SEC employees because they were losing employees like crazy. They lost a third of their senior management because of the pay. Uh, we raised that, but we also held hearings on IT and their IT capacity. What were the limitations? If SEC had wanted to do something, were their systems up? Could they have done the appropriate job? Or are there limitations uh, on their IT and personnel that probably limited their ability? Does anybody have any thoughts on that? No? Okay. Ms. Minow, let me just ask you. You rated the corporate uh, boards at Lehman. Did you ever rate the board and the salaries at Freddie and Fannie? At, I'm sorry, at Freddie and Fannie? Yes. Uh, we did give a high grade to uh, Fannie Mae, after they were, uh, uh, in 2002 when we began rating, after they were cleared by the SEC and OFAO, uh, we, however, from the beginning gave poor ratings to Freddie. Okay. We should have seen this coming, don't you agree? I mean, I don't know if any of you are familiar with the Superior Bank. I just was looking at one Superior Bank, the Inspector General report. This was a Chicago bank uh, owned by the chief owner was Penny Pritzker, who happens to be, as I think many of us know, Senator Obama's finance chairman. But more importantly, when you look at the Inspector General's report, it says that uh, the uh, bank became associated with the subprime lending business in 92. Beginning in 1993, Superior embarked on a business strategy marked by rapid and aggressive growth into subprime home mortgages, 
Federal Bank regulators warned uh, them in 93, 94, 95, 97, and 2000 to rein in their risky subprime lending businesses. According to an independent investigation by the Department of Justice, uh, they, uh, the bank used improper accounting procedures to cover up their bad bets. Um, 1,500 of the bank customers lost large sums of money. But this was years ago. I mean, didn't there were all the warning signs there that these subprimes were a mess, weren't there? Yes, there were. That is why one of my primary concerns is the obstacles to what I would consider you know, the essential market oversight from institutional investors like the Colorado uh, Pension Fund. If they could have responded as I think they would like to have, if the, if, if the corporate community had not lobbied for so many restrictions on the ability of shareholders to respond to these indicators, then I think we would not need a, a lot of new regulation. Mrs., uh, Mr. Walson. Well, I would say that this is a very good example of the, the, the faith in regulation that is often misplaced. Uh, the, the regulators had the responsibility for looking at the risks that were being taken by these institutions, and uh, they did not effectively do that. And I think that uh, that is an important lesson for Congress to understand, because regulation is not a solution to many of these problems especially when the regulators have a great deal of difficulty understanding what is happening in these, in these institutions. The Superior Bank case is a perfect example of something that was starting in 2001 and, and beginning to build at that point with subprime loans. But I am afraid that if, a, uh, if a, a congressional committee or a regulator, uh, let us put it this way, if a congressional committee uh, had looked over the shoulder of the regulators and said, will you stop that from happening, um, I think the regulator would have been reluctant to do it. The institutions were making money from this. And what is more, they were afraid of some of the political backlash that would come if they did try to stop this kind of lending. There is a strong feeling in the United States that many people should be, have access to housing. Yeah. And the question is, do you allow um, the regulators to interfere with um, a strong uh, housing market, uh, especially involving some lower income debt. people were getting housing, and so you did, nobody wanted to stop that. Uh, I think that the problem is not subprime per se. It's a risky lending, but as uh, Mr. Wallinson said, first of all, has beneficial effects. Second, uh, in some situation, a risky activity may be profitable. I think that the problem is that the level of securitization that this took place uh, was not properly monitored. We have a sort of a, an enormous market that got completely sort of uh, unregulated in terms of disclosure. I think we should have more disclosure because today we don't know who owns what. And yeah, as fair. a result of that, a lot of the problems we observe in the credit market is because banks don't know the losses of other banks. They don't know the, the losses because they don't know what they have in their portfolio. And they don't know what they have in portfolio because if you look at the issuance, you cannot trace back easily what is in that package of loans. We don't know whether they are loans from California. You don't know whether they are from Florida. You don't know who has those loans. And this lack of transparency is one of the roots of the problem. It's not subprime. It's the lack of transparency. Uh, just on the, question, on the question of whether we should have known or did we know, I, I'll just say that in, in looking at a full range of economic statistics in the summer of 2005, uh, looking at the value of houses divided by, not, uh, by uh, median income and by many other measures, we knew that the housing pr prices were set for a fall. We were beginning to tell our clients in the autumn of 2005 that, that housing prices were set for a fall and the housing sector was ready for a decline. We were not alone. Many other economists were also giving similar warnings. Thank you, Mr. Davis. Uh, Mr. Cummings. Thank you very much. Uh, Ms. Menno, um, when I went to church yesterday, uh, it is interesting that uh, almost everybody who came up to me afterwards uh, was very upset. And it seemed like the thing that they were most upset about was these this compensation for these executives. Um, as part of the committee's investigation, the committee asked for copies of the emails that Mr. Fold sent and received over the last six months. I, I want to read to you from an email exchange that involves Mr. Fold, his executive committee, and senior executives at Newberger. Berman, a money management subsidiary of Lehman Brothers. 
The first email is sent in early June of this year. It is sent from Newberger Berman executives to Mr. Fold's executive committee. The email begins, and I quote, as long-term employees and former partners of Newberger Berman, we feel compelled to express our views on several matters to members of Lehman's executive committee, end of quote. In the email, the Newberger Berman executives write that Le Lehman had made, manage, quote, management mistakes and that, quote, a substantial portion of the problems at Lehman are structural rather than merely uh, cyclical in nature, end of quote. The email then recommended two actions, and let me read from the email. It says, top management should forego bonuses this year. This would serve a dual purpose. Firstly, it would represent a significant expense reduction. Secondly, it would send a strong message to both employees and investors that management is not sh uh, shirking accountability for recent performance. And then it goes on to say, too, and this is a direct quote, do a partial spin out of NB. A partial spin out could be an attractive source of capital for Lehman at a time when the company needs capital. The officials also suggested that a partial spin out of Newberger Berman would allow some employees to receive their equity compensation in the new Newberger Berman shares instead of Lehman shares, which would, uh, would, which would reassure the Newberger employees uh, of their funds. Question. Ms. Mano, what do you think of the recommendations made in, in this email? And was the recommendations that senior management forego bonuses a sound one? Yes, it was. And why is that? Because, in my opinion, management gets paid last. You know, you, you pay the shareholders, you pay the employees, and then if there's any money left over, you take it. But when the company is doing poorly, management should management compensation should reflect that. Yeah, because when I talk to the people in my block, they tell me, you said something that was very interesting. You said paying people based on volume as opposed to quality is just the wrong way to go. And the people in my block in Baltimore, if they, do, they perform poorly, they get fired. Yeah. That's they how certainly don't get a bonus. That's how and, it works in my company. And Mr. Fold is going to come in here in about an hour, and you know what he's going to say? He's going to say, it's, no, it's everybody's fault but mine, but he was a chief guy. Is that right? He was. He was the captain of the ship. And, and you know, you're familiar with the expression, the buck stops here. You know, it, 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 unfortunately, it did stop with him. He took all the bucks. One of the recipients of that email was George W. Walker. Mr. Walker was Lehman's global head of investment management at the time. And if the name sounds familiar, that's because Mr. Walker also happens to be President uh, Bush's cousin. Within 15 minutes, Mr. Walker writes a follow-up email to the other members of the executive committee. And let me read that to you because it is extremely interesting. He says, sorry, team. I'm not sure what's in the water at 605 Third Avenue today. The compensation issue she raises is hardly worth the EC's, executive committee's, that is, time, time now. I'm embarrassed and I apologize. Mr. Fall, Mr. Fold also mocked the Newberg executives and his response was, don't worry, there are only people who think, listen to this, who think, there are only people who think about their own pockets. Ms. Menno, I see you raise, uh, shaking your head. Yeah. What do you think of Mr. Fold's response? I can imagine what you're going to say because it's clear that he was thinking about his own pockets as he made millions upon millions. You're exactly right, Congressman. I'm horrified by that. I'm absolutely horrified. And I'm thinking about I'm, I'm thinking about what you could possibly say to him when he arrives here to make him understand his responsibility. I wonder how he sleeps at night. Mr. Smith, do, uh, do you have a comment on that? I see you shaking your head, too. You talked about all the employees you represent. Well, it's, you know, it's of interest to me that nowhere in that conversation, nowhere even in their way of thinking does the shareholder have any role whatsoever. And that's who their duty is, too. Thank you very much. I see my time is up. Thank you, Mr. Cummings. Uh, Mr. Micah. Well, first of all, I think it's very important that uh, our committee investigate how we got into this uh, financial mess. I believe Americans want to know uh, who caused this outrage, how it happened, and who will be held accountable. Uh, if it is uh, wrongdoing by AIG or Lehman, uh, in fact, uh, I saw one of these signs out here uh, I, with Code Pink. Uh, 
they said uh, j uh, no bail, jail, which I agree with. In fact, uh, at the conclusion of these hearings, I intend to consult with my colleagues to ask for a special counsel to investigate this matter. The announced hearings, however, today and the ones that we have before us by, uh, selected by the chairman uh, only cover laymen, AIG, and several regulators. Uh, unfortunately, I think this is a, a clever sequencing of these hearings, which is obviously uh, organized to deflect attention from government-backed financial institutions and also deflect uh, from Congress uh, any blame and put it on uh, Wall Street or b blame it on comp executive compensation. Any hearing or real oversight that does not start with Fannie Mae, Franklin Raines, who <laughs> walked away with over a hundred million dollars in executive compensation and bonuses, uh, is at, and also uh, hearing from his accomplices, any hearing will be a sham. This is like investigating the great train robbery and only talking to the dining car stewards. Instead of a balance panel today, we'll take te testimony from acad academics and no one from Fannie Mae or Freddie Mac. Uh, rather clever. The fact is that our nation's current financial crisis began back in 1992 with a concerted effort to expand government-sponsored enterprise, enterprises Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac to include loans to marginally qualified borrowers and get into a whole host of speculative investments. Last week, Speaker Pelosi, Pelosi incorrectly and partisanly attributed the responsibility to the Bush administration's failed economic policies. Chairman Waxman, in his opening statement, is trying today to direct focus on Wall Street and regulators. Last time I checked, none of uh, those folks had a, a vote in Congress. In fact, it was uh, in 1999, and we heard some reference to this uh, already, that to uh, have a copy of the vote here, which we'll put the record later, that Congress voted to repeal the Glass-Steagall Act, allowing banks to engage in speculative ventures, to, <clears throat> uh, and Wall Street followed. In fact, uh, long before Bush took office, the stage was set by the current, uh, for the current financial uh, melt meltdown of the housing and finance industry. In fact, in 1999, the Clinton administration and Fannie Mae directors Rains lowered policy standards and increased subline, uh, subprime loans to new, more dangerous levels. As quoted in the New York Times that year, Rains said, and I quote from Rains, Fannie Mae has expanded home ownership for millions of families in the 90s by reducing down payment requirements. Yet there remain too many borrowers whose credit is just a notch below what our underwriting has required who have been regulated uh, to paying significantly higher mortgages in the uh, so-called subprime market. Wall Street followed. The New York Times article con uh, continued, in moving even tentatively into this uh, new area of lending, Fannie Mae is taking on significantly more risk, which may not pose any difficult during flush economic times, as we saw, but the government subsidized corporation uh, may run into trouble in an economic downturn, prompting a government rescue similar to that to the Savings and Loan Association." I, end quote. In fact, in 2004, Reigns and Freddie Mac CEO Richard Siren uh, told an ABA meeting, end quote, we push products and opportunities to people who have lesser credit. In fact, testimony before the House Financial Services uh, Committee on capital markets and insurance and government-sponsored enterprises on October 6, 2004, Reigns termed some of these loans riskless. That's his quote. In fact, Reigns, by rule change, lowered Fannie Mae's cash reserve requirements from 10 to 2.5 percent. In fact, after fraudulently cooking Fannie Mae's books, so Reigns and Jamie Gorlick and others could boost earnings to rob millions in bonuses. Congressional Democrats chose to ignore the findings during House uh, Financial Services hearing on, on uh, September 10, 2003. Uh, the top uh, Democrat at the time, Barney Frank, said, 
The more uh, people, in my judgment, exaggerate a threat of safety and soundness, the more people conjure up the possibility of serious uh, financial losses to the tre Treasury, which I do not see. I think uh, we see entities that are fundamentally sound and withstand some of the de dis disaster scenarios. Representative Maxine Waters demanded to know why, if it ain't broke, uh, why anybody would want to fix Fannie Mae. More incredibly, Thank Frank you, said Mr. a few uh, Micah, days your, later, your I want time. to roll the Mr. dice Micah, a your... little bit more in this situation. Mr. Micah, you can put the rest of the statement in the and record, I, but your time has expired. Uh, well, since our side is gagged from uh, either giving a uh, statement Mr. Kucinich, or it's your turn uh, now to, uh, just, uh, ask the, the questions. Just having the opportunity to, um, uh, to not ask questions, I want to get, get to ask I, my I question. thought you asked a lot of brilliant questions here. Mr. Kucinich, your turn to ask questions. I thank the gentleman. Uh, Mr. Uh, Wallace, in, in your testimony, you said voters justi are justifiably angry about the $700 billion rescue plan just adopted by Congress. Uh, why? Because much of the problem that. Do, do this, you want to speak closely to the mic? Because much of the problem that this plan is intended to address was caused by a lack of regulation of Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac. Okay, th the, thank you, sir. The, I, bad, I, the bad assets that are now on the books of banks and securities firms all over the world came from a market that they stimulated between 2005 and 2007. Well, thank you, sir. And they Thanks now for hold your I'm about go on a to my, trillion I'm dollars on I'm going to go on with the rest of my questions. Books. I want to say that I agree with you that the American people are angry. I voted against this bailout, and I think that uh, I, I have to say that with all due respect to our chair, uh, who, you know, really is given a mandate to hold hearings after the fact, I'm sorry that these hearings are taking place after we voted on the bailout. I mean, how much better we would have been, how much better informed we would have been if we would had these hearings before uh, the bailout. And I think that it would have, uh, that takes nothing away from uh, Mr. Chairman, who I have the greatest admiration for. But this is a decision that was made by our congressional leaders. Uh, we should have had these hearings first and then taken a vote on a bailout later. Now, I just want to uh, get into the questions of why didn't uh, Secretary Paulson save Lehman. We all know about the implications of the collapse. We don't need, you know, that's what we're here to discuss. Uh, but, you know, my question is uh, why uh, Secretary Paulson decided to bail out AIG and other companies but not uh, Lehman, um, Gretchen Morganson of the New York Times wrote a column about the decision to rescue AIG. She said that Secretary Paulson, a former CEO of Goldman Sachs, made this decision after consulting with Lloyd Blankfein, the current CEO of Goldman Sachs. She also wrote that Goldman Sachs could have been imperiled by the collapse of AIG because Goldman was AIG's largest trading partner. She said Goldman had a $20 billion exposure to AIG. Now, I would like um, uh, Professor Zingales, uh, when, you, when you hear about that, it's a, you know, what decision was made to let Lehman go down. Goldman Sachs is, Sachs is still standing, for sure. Uh, are you concerned, given these facts, that there uh, is an uh, apparent conflict of interest by the Treasury Secretary in permitting a, um, a principal of a firm that uh, he was the CEO with to be involved in in these discussions about the survival of, of Lehman? Yes, I'm certainly concerned by that. But I have to say that uh, I think that the reason, and I'm not saying it was a wide decision, I think that the reason that brought to the AIG bailout is that AIG was a major player in the credit default swap market. Uh, and uh, I think that uh, not only Goldman was very heavily involved with that, JP Morgan, uh, to the best of our ability, J.P. Morgan is as a notional amount of $7 trillion in the credit default swap market. Most of that is hedge in the sense they buy and sell insurance at the same time. So if everybody is uh, holding up, there is no risk. But if uh, AIG went under, all of a sudden uh, J.P. Morgan would have found itself probably on edge for a significant fraction of that sort of a $7.1 trillion. Now, is like well, let, me, let me ask you this. Uh, you throw Lehman Brothers overboard, uh, does that help uh, what competitive position may remain with respect to Goldman Sachs? I think it's clear that Goldman Sachs benefits from Lehman going under. Okay, yes. I want to ask Ms. Minow to answer the question that I asked. Is there an apparent conflict of interest here? Yes, there was. Do you want to elaborate on that? 
Um, I, you know, that's part of the problem of regulating and, and deal making and bailing out in the financial sector. You know, we do regressions about the relationships between the various boards of directors, and overwhelmingly, uh, that is the most tightly knit. And I, you know, I want to thank to you that, for that because, see, what we're confronted with is that bailout legislation gives, gives Secretary Paulson uh, the ability to direct assets over the entire economy, changing forever the idea of a free market. Uh, of a free market and putting him in a direct position where he can benefit the people that he worked with while he was CEO of Goldman Sachs. Does that concern you? I, I, it concerns me greatly, Congressman, and that's why I think it is very important, even though the legislation has already passed, to have these hearings right now because, as you very well know, the implementation uh, is going to tell the story here, and there, um, even though the legislation is now significantly longer than the original proposal sent over by the administration, there is still a lot of room to make it right or make it wrong, and I think it's going to need a lot of oversight. Th thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Kucinich. Mr. Turner? Mr. Mr. Uh, Chairman, I have a unanimous consent request. The gentleman will state his unanimous um, consent request. I would like to ask unanimous consent to uh, to submit for the record the final vote result of uh, Roll Call 570, which is the Glass-Steagall repeal, which you actually and I voted no on. I would like unanimous okay. consent to insert in the record H.R. 4071, which Mr. Shays uh, asked me to co-sponsor as a co-sponsor to uh, register and uh, regulate the federal securities laws to include housing-related government-sponsored enterprises in 2000, March 20, 2002, and I'd like the unanimous consent to submit to the record uh, the legislation entitled Federal Housing Finance Reform Act of 2005, sponsored by Richard Baker, uh, voted for by myself and others. You weren't with me on that one. That would have uh, uh, resolved this, and also the vote of that, I think, are uh, Im important to include in the record. Without objection, that Thank will you. be the order. Mr. Turner. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I also voted against the bailout package, and, and I voted against the bailout package because I believe that it did nothing to prohibit the types of practices we're going to discuss today. It provided no real relief to communities or homeowners who are impacted as a result of these practices. And I believe that there's no real understanding of what the requirements will be for administering such a program as we look to the underlying mortgages and the number of, of housing and housing units that's there. Also, I don't believe that the value is ultimately going to be there when they take a look at the mortgages and, and the, um, uh, the mortgage security, backed securities that they're going to be acquiring. Dr. Westcott, you said that you gave us about four or five points as to how this happened. Easy credit, housing prices escalating, um, securitization of mortgages, houses becoming ATMs, and Ms. Minow, you indicated also excessive, excessive CEO compensation. Well, I'm from Ohio, and we're one of the um, leaders, unfortunately, in the area of foreclosures. And I want to tell you a little bit about what our experience is, and I'd like to get your, your thoughts on this. In 2001, I was serving as mayor for my community, and then City Commissioner Dean Lovelace, who was a leader in our community of, of trying to advocate for people who were victims of predatory lending, brought to the attention of the City Commission and ultimately legislation, which we passed but were not able to, to enforce, attempting to prohibit predatory lending practices in our community. We then began working with the Miami Valley Fair Housing Center in our community to work directly with people who were impacted. And our community in uh, the past two years has had 5,000 foreclosures on an annual basis in a county of about 500,000 people. The state of Ohio, I believe, is, is clipping along at uh, about 80,000 uh, plus of foreclosures. And, and um, Dr. Westcott, we're not seeing the housing price escalation is the problem. Ohio is not a state that saw wild fluctuations in housing values. In fact, the Miami Valley Fair Housing Center, Jim McCarthy, the director there, tells me that this is what we experience. Houses that are uh, probably valued between seventy-five, eighty thousand dollars $80,000, people who found the American dream, who got a traditional lending product, uh, were convinced to refinance their house by unscrupulous lenders, predatory lenders, subprime lenders, convinced that the property value was worth 100000 many times capitalizing the fees, giving the ultimate homeowner a small portion of the, of the cash in the refinancing. The homeowner then facing many times interest rates or payments, the schedules that they're either not familiar with or not prepared to make. In any event, uh, finding perhaps hard economic times or other circumstances where they realize that the value of the property um, is, 
is below the actual mortgage value. And ultimately, this property going through foreclosure becomes abandoned in my community, um, sitting with a leaking roof, broken windows, and many times is now worth $20,000, uh, requiring tens of thousands of dollars for it to even be habitable. We're seeing that scourge around our community. And when I see that, I don't see bad loan choices. I don't see people who, um, who just were stretching for the American dream but could not afford it. I see someone having stolen the American dream, where there was a homeowner and a family that was sitting there that were convinced to them what they thought was the most regulated transaction in our country, protected by the federal government and rules and regulations, um, caught in a cycle of, of um, refinancing. But there's someone who knew. The person who originated this loan knows that the value of the property isn't there. They know that this homeowner is not going to be able to make it. And ultimately, as we now know, they take that loan, securitize it, and sell it back, likely to the bank that had the first mortgage to begin with that wouldn't have given them a loan like that. Now, again, I believe that these people stole. And I believe it was systematic stealing at such an unbelievable and grand scale um, that, that um, it is going to be very difficult for us to unwind this. In those circumstances, I'd like your thoughts on that very process. Uh, Mr. Turner, um, uh, you described very eloquently a, a, um, a, a second type of housing problem that we're having in this country. We really have two housing problems. We have the, the um, credit-oriented problem that, that is uh, heavily focused in Florida, California, uh, Las Vegas, and so on. And because this part of the economy, because the housing sector of the economy started uh, weakening, we've, we've actually eaten into um, real disposable income. We've hurt consumer spending across the country. And what that's done is that's lowered demand for automobiles, for industrial goods, and so on. And that's the, the, the core part of the problem in the state of Ohio. It's the same in Michigan. Uh, this is, uh, these are regions that have lost hundreds of thousands of industrial jobs, as you well know. And so the, the fundamental problem in Ohio is, is the loss of jobs and the, uh, uh, the fact that many people just don't have the income they did two years ago or four years ago. Mr. Turner, I want to repeat that one of the most important factors in creating this problem was pay plans that rewarded the executives on the basis of the number of transactions rather than the quality of transactions. And as I said the last time I spoke to this committee, of course we could never pay Congress what you're worth, but if we were paying you based on the number of laws rather than the quality of the laws, I think you see what the, res what the result would be. And when we created these pay packages so that they were benefited by just generating as many transactions as possible, chopping them up, sending them all over the place in a form that could no longer be valued accurately, to me that is one of the key sources of this problem. Well, as we talk many times about falling housing prices, it's going to be interesting when we actually get into these mortgage-backed securities and look at these mortgage transactions, because I think we will find that many of these loans were given on housing prices that, that where the value wasn't there to begin with. I, I, I agree, and I understand that in some cases even the title searches were not completed. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Turner. Uh, Mr. Uh, Tierney. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I want to thank all of our uh, panel for testifying today. I know we're, we're going to have this hearing and about four other hearings uh, trying to understand the process that uh, got us into the situation. And today we're focusing on Lehman Brothers. Over the weekend, we all got a chance to look at Mr. Fold's proposed testimony for today. And in looking at that, it appears that he blames just about everyone and everything except himself and the other executives for the downfall of Lehman. So I wanted to begin by asking this panel uh, for a full diagnosis of just what went on. What were the factors that went into this? Mr. Fold says it was a litany of stable, destabilizing factors, rumors, credit agency downgrades, naked short attacks. He says ultimately lack of confidence and in the end he was overwhelmed. So I want to ask each of you whether or not you agree with that, that uh, Mr. Fold was a victim of the circumstances or whether or not he and his fellow executives made mistakes causing the collapse of the company and eventually putting all of us in jeopardy. Ms. Minow, uh, if I begin with you, do you agree with Mr. Fold's uh, diagnosis? No, I think it's horrific. I can't believe that he would have the chutzpah to say something like that. I, I hold him completely responsible. I hold him responsible and his board responsible for the foreseeable consequences of the decisions they made. Pro Professor Zingales, uh, what are your views on that? I think he's definitely responsible for having a too aggressive leverage policy uh, 
too much short-term debt and makes the firm sort of uh, at risk of a bank run. That is exactly what happened. And uh, to have not have control the risk that the firm was taking uh, during the, this boom period. Um, all this said, is also true that uh, we are in exceptional circumstances. And uh, I think that uh, the, the system is suffering of lack of liquidity. And so it is possible that a lot of banks and firms that in normal times were not being solvent today find themselves insolvent. So the example is, suppose that we had no mortgages. What would be the price of your house? And we are in that situation right now. The banks are not lending. And if the banks are not lending, we don't know what the prices of anything is. And uh, at those prices, it's very easy that a lot of firms, a lot of banks, are insolvent. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Smith, you're the only investor on the panel. Uh, what are your views? Well, um, certainly I hold him responsible, but I think it goes beyond that. Is, is your mic on? Uh, I, I certainly hold him responsible. I certainly think they made conscious decisions to take risks that went far beyond the interests of the shareholder. But I also look at the directors and I look at their responsibility for, for overseeing management and I look at the regulatory system that, that denies investors the opportunity to hold directors accountable. So there, there are multiple pieces to the puzzle, but uh, I don't believe that he has any safe ground to stand on. Thank you. You know, uh, Professor Zingales and, and Ms. Minow, if I were to put you or you were to put yourself in Mr. Full's position, in, in 2007, Lehman Brothers paid out nearly $5 billion in bonuses. Uh, he himself got a $4 million cash bonus, but at the same time they did that, they spent over $4 billion buying back shares of stock. And they paid out $750 million in dividends. Were those actions that almost $10 billion of capital dissipated in that sense, were those wise decisions under the circumstances? Uh, no, I don't think they were. And I will say that I'm a real radical on the subject of um, CEO stock sales. He was also selling a lot of his stock at that time. And I don't believe that CEO should be allowed to sell stock while they're still in the company. Mr. Dr. Zingales. No, they're not, they were not wise decision. He should have sort of uh, saved and increased the equity base, not uh, reduce it in that moment. Yeah, I, I noticed that in June of 2008, uh, the Lehman Brothers had a $2.8 billion loss on their books, and that sent everything uh, stunning the market, sent everything spinning. If they had that $10 billion that had gone to bonuses and to uh, dividends and buybacks, it certainly seems that they might have uh, avoided that situation as well. Uh, do you know, Dr. Singalis, what the amount of money that uh, Mr. Fold was seeking from the Korean Development Bank toward the end? Uh, no, I don't know the exact amount. Do you, uh, Ms. Minow? No, I do not. Okay. I believe it was probably $6 billion or less. Uh, and and I, my point was, again, if you take that $10 billion off the books, you lost that opportunity to, uh, to do something substantial in terms of saving that company and saving our economy on that. But we can explore that further uh, with uh, Mr. Fold. But I do want to just cover an email exchange between Mr. Fold and one of his top executives, David uh, Goldfarb. It's dated May 26th of 2008. In that, Mr. Goldfarb reports that a possible deal with the Korean Development Bank would provide seven billion several billion dollars worth of new capital to Lehman. Mr. Goldfarb describes what he would like to do with the money, and he writes as follows. It feels like this could, could become real. If we did raise five billion dollars, I like the idea of aggressively going into the market and spending two of the five and buying back lots of stock and hurting Einhorn bad. Now, in the email, Mr. Goldfarb was referring apparently to David Einhorn, who was at the time publicly critical of Lehman and was shorting its stock. Mr. Fold wrote in a short response, I agree with all of it. So here's how I read this email. Lehman was dangerously low on capital, had possibly found an investor willing to give them billions of dollars, and what they wanted to do with it, however, was buy back stock and punish a short seller. Mr. Smith, what are your views about that email exchange being an investor? Well, um, horrified. What, uh, when you know that you're low on cash, when you know that you've exposed your company to what I've heard is ranging from, 50, from 35 to 70 times leverage, and you're giving away your cash with a motive of punishing someone rather than benefiting your shareholders, that's the ultimate breach. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Attorney. Ms. Watson? I really think this is the most important hearing we have had in this particular Congress. I think 
the experts for coming out uh, this morning. I just returned from California, the largest state in the Union, 38 million people. It was a turnaround for me. And I tell you, they followed me out of church. They followed me at several dinners, political dinners. Everyone was outraged over the $850 billion of their monies to bail out people who have shown nothing but corporate greed. And uh, I'm hoping that as a result of the six hearings we're going to have, that we can come out with a policy that uh, will really curtail this greed out of control. Now, um, looking at Lehman Brothers and trying to get to the bottom of what caused this economic crisis that we're in, uh, the makeup of the board may provide some insight with uh, what went wrong. Seven of the ten board members were retired. Many of them lacked Wall Street experience, and uh, the layman board members included the former head of Telemundo, who was a retired Navy Admiral, and a theater producer. And so I'm directing this to uh, Ms. Minow. Uh, you're an expert on corporate government, uh, governance. Uh, do you have concerns about the effectiveness of the layman board? And let me just mention one board member, uh, Mr. Roger Berlin, the theater producer. He's been on the board for 20 years and sits on the audit and the finance and risk committees. Uh, what are your concerns about having a board full of people like Mr. Berlin? Um. Thank you, Ms. Watson. Uh, as I said in my testimony, we rate boards based on the decisions they make and not on their resumes. And I will say, in fairness to Mr. Berlin, that yes, he is a theatrical producer. He does have a background in finance and was the co-founder of a Wall Street firm at one time. However, I think it is clear that the members of this board had no clue about the kinds of securities and other issues, the, the derivative securities and the credit default swaps that we've heard about today. And the fact that the risk committee met only twice, two years in a row, I think tells you everything you need to know. So I, I rate this board very, very poorly. They currently get an F from us. I see one of the biggest problems uh, uh, in corporate governments is how entrenched the board can become. Mm -hmm. And under current law, there's no effective way for shareholders to challenge an incompetent or negligent board. And in the bill-out bill, uh, Chairman Barney Frank tried to address the problem of these entrenched boards. And he said that shareholders should be able to propose their own candidates for the board. The theory behind this reform is that if the board gets too close to management, as the Lehman board did, the shareholders can vote in a new board with more independence and oversight. Unfortunately, uh, Secretary Paulson insisted that this corporate governance reform be dropped from the bill. So I'd like to ask you first, uh, Ms. Menon, uh, was this an important reform? And then Mr. Smith, do you have a view on this? And uh, Mr. Zingales, uh, what do you think? In that order, please. Uh, this is a crucial reform. Uh, Mr. Smith mentioned it in his testimony. I've got it in my uh, in my written remarks. At this point, you know, it, it, I always love bringing this up when I'm speaking to the committee because one thing that you all understand very, very well here, very intimately, is the concept of an election. And yet, we call it an election for a corporate board, and only one person runs. No one runs against them, and management counts the votes. It's a pretty good system. And we've got to have some way. This is exactly what I'm talking about when I say we need to remove the impediments to oversight from investors so that we can can remove directors. There are currently more than 20 directors serving on boards today who did not receive majority vote from their shareholders. Shareholders did everything they could to say, we don't want you, and they're still serving. So we definitely need to improve that system. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, that certainly is one of the biggest reforms I'd like to see. It's the only thing, the only place I've ever seen where... Is your mic on? Pardon me? Is your mic on? Yes, it is. Okay. Um, where our representative, the shareholder's representative, is not picked by the shareholders. And the shareholders have nothing to say about who they are. And they're not accountable to the shareholders. Their presence in the boardroom is dependent upon management. And whether or not management puts them on the slate, that is not a good connection for the shareholders to have their voice heard in the boardroom. And it's failed us. 
I completely ag agree with you. In fact, uh, there are very few things that the United States can learn from Italy, but Italy has a law that allows representative of institutional investors to be elected on board, and I happen to be one of those. I sit on the board of one of the largest companies in Italy, Telecom Italia, as representative of institutional investors, and I sit on their compensation committee, and I can actually argue about their compensation. And I can tell you that last year I wasn't particularly polite in, in, in sort of a, the conversation. And if I was appointed by management, I would not have been renewed. But I was renewed because I'm appointed by institutional investors and I represent shareholders on that board. So I think that would be a very important reform that uh, we could pass. Thank you, Thank Ms. you Watson. Thank you so much. Uh, Mr. Higgins. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, just a couple of thoughts before I. Um, Virtually every recession or severe economic downturn originates in excesses in the financial economy, and then they go on to ruin the real economy. I think the recent financial crisis is consistent with that, and I find in my review of the facts four basic abuses, a lack of transparency, excessive leveraging, conflicts of interest, and most egregious, the probability of dishonesty and deceit. Lehman Brothers didn't just collapse on September 15th. Its financial situation has been getting increasingly dire with each passing quarter. But Lehman's executives kept telling shareholders and public investors that its finances were in great shape. In September 2007, Lehman's chief financial officer told investors, quote, our liquidity position is stronger than ever. In December 2007, CEO Richard Fold said, quote, our global franchise and brand have never been stronger. In March 2008, Lehman fired its chief executive officer and hired a new one. The new chief financial officer told investors, quote, I think we feel better about our liqui liquidity than we ever have. In June 2008, CEO Richard Fold told shareholders, quote, our capital and liquidity positions have never been stronger. And on September 10th, five days before Lehman filed for bankruptcy protection, Lehman made upbeat comments to investors and research analysts. Mr. Smith, you represent a state pension fund. Your fund manages retirement assets of public employees in the state of Colorado. What do you think about these statements by Mr. Fold and others at Lehman? Were they giving you an honest assessment of what was going on inside the company? Well, clearly, um, they were not giving us a, a, an honest assessment of it. And unfortunately, um, neither were the books, uh, neither were the auditors. Uh, there was no piece of the puzzle that allowed us. We're big boys and girls. We, we invest billions of dollars. We understand how to invest. We understand how to do due diligence. But you have to have the tools to do that. And you have to have people who are going to be honest enough to tell you the facts, or at least uh, have you have the ability to go mine the facts yourself. And in today's uh, situation, and, and for many years now, we've been unable, we've been impaired in our ability to do that. Professor Zingales, uh, what is your view? Could Mr. Fold have been truthful uh, when he said in June of 2008 that our capital and liquidity positions have never been stronger. It's hard to imagine that uh, was never stronger than that. I think that uh, uh, it's clear that uh, was a moment of crisis, and uh, it's clear that he didn't have a good understanding of what the situation was. If it's true, as was said, that he was indicating that he would buy back stocks in order to punish the analysts. I think this is, uh, sorry, the short sellers. This is a typical situation of overconfidence by a CEO that doesn't see the problems as they should be. And he thinks that the responsibility is all of the market that gets it wrong, is all of the short sellers, the short seller stocks, and they don't see the problem coming. Mr. Fold had a vested interest in painting a rosy picture at Lehman. If he had disclosed its precarious situation, it could have put more pressure on the company. That's why I believe the disclosure rules are so important. Investors should have to rely on the rosy assessment of corporate executives. They should be able to verify those statements in reviewing public filings of the company. Mr. Smith or Dr. Westcott, 
What are your ver views about disclosure rules? Well, I was just mentioning I should have hit transparency a little harder in my answer. I appreciate the, the loop back because that's what we believe w was lacking with the off-balance sheet opportunities, with the loosened accounting rules, with the obfuscation of the leverage that they were actually imposing on the assets of the organization that were in large part undetectable by an investor. Uh, didn't have much of a fair shot at assessing our risk when we got into that. Uh, a, a quick comment. Um, basically, there are two ways you can go if you're going to regulate an industry. You can have very, very tight regulation. Uh, at, the, at the limit, you can imagine a regulator basically working full time in the institution, looking at every number every day, and, and, and that's um, one way you could go. The other way is to back off and to allow uh, to have uh, less day-to-day, uh, -day, minute to minute regulation. Um, if you're going to go that way, though, you have to, the, the key building block is disclosure and transparency. Yeah. And uh, uh, that's, uh, if, you don't have, if you don't have this very minute level of regulation, you have to have disclosure and transparency. Right. Thank you, Mr. Higgins. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Ms. McCollum. I want to go back to September 10th because that's five days before the bankruptcy filing. Uh, it's my understanding that the Chief Financial Officer uh, uh, Lowett held a conference call for investors and that was reported in the Wall Street Journal. And in fact, some of the bankers even advised them not to hold this call because there were going to be too many open questions. And I'd like to know from the panel, uh, to your understanding, uh, is this accurate? I don't have any information about that, sorry. Uh, my understanding is that the, at the time that they were making this call, they were trying to raise capital through new in, uh, investors or by off-selling assets. Um, Dr. Westcott, Dr. Gonzalez, any comment on that? Unfortunately, I don't, I don't know the, the details of what was going on. Yeah, neither do I. One of the concerns um, that I had, Dr. Gonzalez, from your testimony, you talked about how there's, there, there, were, there were three uh, issues kind of involved to layman's collapse. One of them that we haven't uh, spoken about very much was um, the whole idea of uh, the, 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 the credit market swap that, mm -hmm. that was involved in here. Um, so irrespective of whether or not they were making good investments, and they definitely were not in the home mortgage securities. Could you elaborate on Lehman Brothers' role in the credit swap? Actually, uh, the role of Lehman in the credit default swap market is relatively limited. There is a, a figure, a table in my long testimony, I think is uh, table five, that reports uh, the best numbers we have regarding sort of uh, the amount of uh, credit default swaps in place, and Lehman is uh, 25th in the list. Uh, so they definitely had some sort of play in the market, but not a huge play in that market. But when there's lack of confidence uh, in the market, what, to what degree did these credits, I mean, they were out there hustling for cash, looking for something. Uh, they knew that they had problems with, their, with, with the loans that they had accrued. The fact that they got even involved in doing this uh, credit swap, does that, does that bring any, from what I've, my research, that does not bring any stability to a, to a company. In fact, it adds to destability. Uh, depends what position they take, because if they were hedging their risk by taking insurance on loan they made, this should, in principle, have reduced their risk. Of course, if they were selling insurance, uh, that was, would have been crazy. But I don't think at that time people would have bought their insurance because uh, they were sort of uh, rumored to be in, in difficulty. So uh, you don't want to buy insurance from an insurance company that you're not sure is going to be around to pay when uh, your house is in trouble, for example. Could I ask each one of the panels, there was great discussion about privatizing Social Security. And as we've heard from the gentleman from uh, Colorado, a lot of pensions had their uh, security assets, in fact, involved in these types of uh, products. Could you tell me what would, what in your opinion 
um, privatizing Social Security would have meant for uh, Americans today had that plan gone through? Well, the the beauty in our view for as a as a pension system and a particularly a hybrid defined benefit pension system is that we are able to pool at least some of these market risks for our members. Uh, the members in our system who were within a, a year or so of retiring and, and faced this crisis probably still have the ability to retire because we have a long-term ability to provide those benefits. If they were on their own and they were in individual accounts that were uh, under their control and their responsibility, um, they would be left with only that and, and that would be inadequate to provide for them in these, these times and, and this cycle would have caused them to go back to work for, for years into the future. Uh, so it would be devastating to have individuals, in my view, to have individuals in individual accounts uh, out there trying to survive in what is a lack, in a market that lacks transparency. Uh, just uh, on, on the, sp there, are, there are many different uh, proposals of how to do a privatization of Social Security. There's carve out, there's add on, and so on. So it's difficult to know exactly uh, which type of plan we'll be talking about. The key uh, uh, for, re for ensuring safe retirements for Americans is diversification. Uh, a, uh, a blend of income, some coming from Social Security, some coming from um, uh, uh, company plans, some coming from private uh, you know, 401k plans or individual plans. Uh, what we really want is to have a blend of, of money so that you, you have multiple sources, each of them subject to different risks. Okay, thank, you. thank you very much. Uh, did you, anyone else wish to respond to the question? Uh, thank you, Ms. McCollum. Mr. Van Hollen? Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. I thank all of the witnesses uh, for being here. Uh, today. I just want to pick up on uh, a point that uh, Ms. Minow raised in her testimony regarding the link between executive compensation and overall performance. Uh, we are looking at Lehman Brothers as a case study today. We have AIG uh, tomorrow and then we will go on to some of the more systemic uh, issues. But I think what we are seeing today, just looking at Lehman Brothers, is a good case study of the fact that you don't have this alignment between pay and performance. Uh, in fact, as my colleague uh, Mr. Cummings was saying, uh, unlike the rest of America where pay for more performance means you, you get rewarded when you do well, but you actually get, you, you, there are disincentives. Uh, you get cut in pay when you do poorly. The fact of the matter is on Wall Street, you do well when they do well, and you do well when they are doing poorly. Uh, and that clearly uh, is a, a mismatch. And I think it is important uh, to to look at this to make the recommendations uh, you have talked about in terms of what we can do legislatively uh, to better align uh, stockholders' uh, interests uh, with those of the executives who are making decisions. Uh, and one problem, I think, is the fact that uh, people are urged to take big risks to maximize short-term pay and bonuses at the expense of longer-term uh, the well-being of the company uh, and the stockholders. Uh, and I think one of the reasons that happens is because people think that when they make bad decisions, they're going to still get bailed out. And I want to talk to you briefly about uh, a, a memo uh, that was written at Lehman Brothers by the Compensation Committee on September uh, 11th. That's four days before Lehman Brothers declared uh, bankruptcy. And it's a recommendation uh, from uh, Lehman Brothers to the Compensation Committee uh, of the Board. It discusses a number of the separation uh, payments, including one of them to Andy Morton. Uh, Mr. Morton was the head of Lehman's Global uh, Head of Fixed Income. Uh, he was the person who was responsible for the leverage investments uh, that were a good part of what drove uh, Lehman into bankruptcy. Uh, another was uh, Mr. Benoit Savare, uh, a member of Lehman's Executive uh, Committee. It says that they have both been involuntarily terminated. They have been fired. Uh, and so you would think, you know, when you get fired, bad performance, no pay, but it goes on to recommend giving them cash separation payments combined of $20 million, uh, $16.2 million for Mr. Savare uh, and $2 million for Mr. Uh, Morton. And it calls in the memo, they describe these as special payments, uh, and 
they come up with a rationale for providing uh, these kind of last minute bailouts to these guys. Is this, is this part of the mentality of sort of a insatiable, uh, you know, in, insatiable sense of entitlement uh, on, on Wall Street that suggests that even when you do badly, someone's going to be there to bail you out? Uh, I couldn't possibly have put it as well as you did, Congressman. That was perfect. Um, I had to laugh, though, when you said this was a good case study. I wish it was the only case study. It's just replicated over and over and over and over again. And you're right. Um, they are so completely out of touch that on the upside, they always say, I'm responsible. It's a market test. I'm Michael Jordan. I'm A-Rod. I deserve this. But on the downside, it's never their fault. And uh, if, if, we, if we don't have better shareholder oversight, if we don't have better market response to them, then they're never going to get the message. Let me uh, just read to you their description of why, why these are uh, apparently justified in their view. They say these executives are, quote, very experienced senior executives with val valuable business skills and experience that the corporation may wish to leverage. Uh, again, these are the guys who helped, uh, obviously, contribute right. to the, the downfall. It also says, and I quote, the corporation would face significant impact if the terminating executives should fail to provide appropriate transition assistance, solicit clients, or engage in other behavior that may be detrimental uh, to the corporation. Now that you've heard uh, the rationale, does that pass the common sense smell test? Not at all. But this goes back to a point that I made earlier, where, as I said, I take a very hard line. I don't believe they should be allowed to sell their stock until after they leave the company. And if that doesn't motivate them adequately, then they're not paying attention. But I think it's hilarious that they use the term leverage, because one thing we've learned about this company is they didn't understand leverage at all. <laughs> Mr. Smith, as uh, somebody who is, uh, entrusts these individuals with lots of decisions, is that the kind of pay for performance uh, that you would want to see? Uh, certainly not, and, and certainly um, highlights our, our desire to have say on pay as a shareholder, to be able to be in the boardroom or have a representative in the boardroom that actually is looking at those payments and saying, how is this going to bring value to my shareholders? And I would contend that there is categorically no way those payments could bring value to the shareholders. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Van Holler. Uh, Mr. Cooper? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I would like to explore the role of excessive leverage in the downfall of Lehman Brothers. Uh, Professor Zangala starts his whole testimony by saying that the downfall of Lehman Brothers is the result of its very aggressive leveraging policy. Uh, could you help the public understand um, how leverage magnifies gains or losses? Sure. Let me make sure that uh, we all understand what we're talking about. When you buy a house and you put a 10 percent down, you're basically buying something that is worth 10 times what you put down. So your, your ratio is 10 to 1. That's, that's a leverage. So what Lehman was doing was 30 to, to 1. So it was much more than what uh, uh, most people do in buying their house. And, uh, and this exposed you enormously to fluctuations in the value of the underlying assets. So if you have, as I, as I said in my testimony, if you have a drop of only 3.3 percent in the value of your assets, your entire value of the equity is wiped out, and so you are insolvent. And uh, this system is, uh, as was mentioned by the chairman, is very rewarding on the upside, so that uh, when things go well, you have very high sort of uh, earnings, you have very high return on capital, and this allows to pay very large bonuses. On the downside, this is very dramatic. And so uh, especially given sort of uh, the situation in which we, we, we were, uh, the risk on their assets and the risk of a downturn in the housing market that was not sort of uh, not foreseeable, uh, I think their leverage policy should have been much more cautious. But also, it's not only the leverage, it's also how much of that leverage is short term. Uh, because uh, when uh, you have a problem, the short-term lenders can leave you and create a situation of insolvency, which is exactly where Lehman was. And before the beginning of the crisis, 50 percent of that leverage was made of short-term debt, which is very profitable in the short term, because short-term debt, especially in the current environment, is much cheaper than long, but exposes more to a risk of a run, and that's exactly what happened. So Lehman was levered. I think at the start of Dick Foles' tenure at 27 times, then it went to 37 times. Uh, and now that there are no major investment banks left on Wall Street, 
even Goldman Sachs and Morgan, as I understand, are down to about 10 times leverage. So it's been a substantial contraction of the leverage ratios. Uh, Dr. Wallison, could you tell us what you think an appropriate leverage ratio would be for investment banks, assuming we have major investment banks return to America I don't, one day? I don't think, Congressman, that you can give a number. It depends very much on the risks uh, that they are encountering in the market at a given time. It is obvious. Uh, it should have been obvious to the management of Lehman and any other management that uh, when things can't continue, as Herb Stein once said, they will stop. And as a result, uh, provision should have been made uh, for a downturn. But there isn't a number that is the right number under any circumstances. But it is sounding today, since no firm, major firm left in the country is leveraged at 30 to 40 to 1, that that must be too much, right? Another point about leverage is the fulcrum on which the lever rests, the capital, or the equity that Lehman thought it had on its balance sheet. And, Professor Zingales, didn't you say in your testimony that on the day it went bankrupt, it supposedly had $26 billion on yeah. its balance sheet? $26 billion in book value of equity. The problem is that uh, the market value of that equity depends crucially on the value of its assets. And, uh, and the uncertainty that was created on the value of the assets, in part by lack of transparency, in part by liquidity crisis, made impossible to know exactly what, what, it, what it was. And when the market becomes nervous, that is the moment they pull out their money. That is the reason why having a lot of short-term debt is not wise, because in that situation you can have literally a bank run, and that is what happened. So a contraction in credit because of excessive leverage crushed $26 billion in capital, which we question the value of anyway, because apparently mark-to-market accounting rules didn't necessarily apply quickly enough in this case. Um, and I think that leaves a lot of folks back home wondering whether this is Wall Street or a casino. <laughs> because as you conclude your testimony, Professor Zingales, you say, um, Lehman did not find itself in the situation by accident. It was the unlucky draw of a consciously made gamble. That no. doesn't sound like an investment. That sounds like uh, gambling. I, I think that, uh, as I said in my testimony, they were too aggressive in their leverage, and that is the reason why I think that uh, they should not have been bailed out. My major concern is that if we bail out everybody who took those gambles, we are going to create incentives to have more gambles down the, down the line. And I think that uh, uh, there, there is a strategy in Wall Street that is sort of a, to take a lot of gambles on the upside and then uh, walk away when things don't, don't work out. And if you don't get punished when things don't work out, everybody will play that, that gamble over and over again. So I think we have to be very careful on what we do now, because I think that what we are doing now will define the incentives for a generation to come. Thank well, you, gentlemen, you'll, just, to, just for me to point out that the regulation of commercial banks is that the leverage is no more than four to one. So uh, I guess every, all the banks are now commercial banks, uh, but there is a spelling out of a, of a, of a leverage number. Uh, the no. next uh, person to question would be uh, Mr. Uh, Sarbanes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Of course, we have all alluded to the fact that there is a lot of people who are angry out there in the country. I expect that uh, when we are done with these five hearings, they are going to be a lot angrier because they had, they had deep suspicion about this culture of greed and recklessness on Wall Street. And now they are going to have plenty of proof positive of it once we are done with these hearings. I don't think there is any surprise to be found in the, in the huge either uh, 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 golden parachute packages or compensation or salaries that these folks got used to thinking they should have. When you look at the amount of money that they are playing with, and I use the word play, the phrase play with rather than manage, because that's where seem, things seem to get. Uh, so you put it in that context, um, and they lose all perspective. They're not living really in the same world that everybody else is living when they're dealing with these kinds of dollars under these sorts of uh, conditions. And I got to go back to what uh, Congressman Higgins was, was asking about before, because 
if you're Richard Fold, I mean, how do you how how do you lose all common sense? I'm I'm looking at these statements that he made late in the game, like right before this thing falls apart. Our global franchise and brand name, uh, uh, our brand have never been stronger. In June of 2008, still in this year, our capital and liquidity positions have never been stronger. The, this is a no-win statement from him because either he's lost all perspective and is completely clueless in a statement like that, or he's, he's quite savvy, but he's deceiving people uh, affirmatively. Um, you could pull anybody out of any coffee house anywhere in this country or a small businessman and you could lay out for them the, the basic metrics of what was happening to this company at that moment in time. And they would say, are you kidding me? Are you kidding me that this was a strong position? I mean, anyone would recognize that. So here's my question. How does this happen? Talk to me a little bit about the culture, the external culture. In other words, if you're Richard Fold, you've got, you've got your company's culture that you're dealing with, and then you've got the larger culture. So what happens that makes him lose such perspective, or if you want to look at it another way, think he can get away with this uh, kind of uh, public uh, pronouncement? Is it the parties you're going to? Is it the fact that the analyst division of your own company suddenly evaporates and stops doing its job? I mean, what is happening to get you to this point? Anybody? Oh. Yes. Let me uh, take a first cut at this. Um, think of the following. You're, you're having a monthly management meeting of your management team. You have your, the, the heads of your profit units there, and you're giving, if you're the CEO, you're giving them their profit targets, for the, let's say, for the quarter. This trading desk, you're, you're expected to have $100 million of profit. That trading desk, $50 million, and so on. In the room, you have the corporate risk officer. And these companies, all of the investment banks, have risk officers. Their job is to be looking at the financial developments, at the trends of housing prices, subprime loans, and so on. And when you're sitting around the table, the, 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 the profit managers are, are, are explaining what their prospects are for hitting that profit target. Presumably, the risk officer is there saying, well, we're getting kind of nervous here because uh, we're now pushing the envelope in this area. I think maybe we need to cut back the profit target for that, let's say, that trading activity or that whatever activity because it's starting to feel risky. Ultimately, that's what the CEO is being paid for. He's being paid for that judgment, hearing the debate that's going on. And uh, probably in many of these cases, the risk officers were not speaking up quite loudly enough. Um, Mr. Sarbanes, um, I always say that when I look at boards of directors, more than being a financial analyst more than being a lawyer, I'm an anthropologist because I think you have to look at kind of the anthropology of the boardroom. And when you've got a CEO who picks his board to make sure that it's a bunch of retirees who barely know what a derivative is and have a risk committee that meets only twice in a year, you've got kind of an emperor's new clothes problem. Nobody wants to tell him the truth and he intentionally surrounds himself with people who are complicit. If you look at, at the part of my testimony where I talk about the related party transactions, these were people who were getting side payments from the company. They had no incentive to provide any kind of independent oversight. And that's why it's so important to let shareholders like Mr. Smith throw some of these people out. Well, they called they call Mr. Fold the gorilla, right? So maybe they should have had Jane Goodall in there doing an analysis from an anthropologist. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, uh, Mr. Sarbanes. Mr. Welch? Uh, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I thank the witnesses. Uh, Mr. Wallace, and I happen to agree with some of your uh, criticism about Fannie Mae and, and Freddie Mac and uh, the walkaway uh, uh, bonuses to the folks who ran that company, uh, the, those public enterprises into the ground are pretty despicable. And, uh, you know, frankly, it's mystifying to me why somebody would get over $100 million for essentially buying and selling mortgages. It's not that complicated. Right. Uh, they, as a public entity, are now prohibited uh, from lobbying. I have a question uh, of you. Uh, do you believe that in view of the fact that the taxpayers now have $700 billion in the game, that 
restriction on lobbying should apply to banks or other agencies that choose, choose to participate in the benefit of this taxpayer bailout? No. Um, the restriction on Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac from lobbying comes from the fact that they are now controlled by the Federal Government. There isn't any need for them to come to Congress and inform Congress in particular. Um, lobbying serves a very valuable function, in my view, in informing Congress about what its let legislation me, me, uh, will actually do. Let me just clarify it. The, the distinction between a paid lobbyist and then representatives on the actual payroll of Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac coming in, for which I have no objection. I, I, don't, I don't see a difference really between those two, whether, you're in, whether you are salaried by the company or whether you are retained outside. Um, lobbyists have a valuable function. And Congress should consult with, listen to lobbyists. You have to discount them appropriately, listen to both sides. But it is a very dangerous thing for Congress or anyone else to wall yourself off from the information that, that uh, the companies themselves can provide about the effect of your All right. legislation. Let me, let me uh, rephrase the question a little bit. I, I do agree with you that lobbying uh, is, a, is a very uh, valuable uh, activity for people to come in and petition. My question is whether taxpayers should help pay for it. Sure. So, Mr. Of course. Zingale, for uh, for individual companies, Mr. Congressman, if I can just finish yeah, the, the question, this is very important for them to make sure that Congress people who are making decisions on legislation that could affect them substantially are well informed. And that directly affects the shareholders. Okay. I, I agree with you. Uh, and the question, I just want to phrase it because I don't want to turn this into lobbying or not. But the question really has to do with the fact that there's $700 billion of taxpayer money uh, in this bailout effort, and should any of that money be allowed to be used for lobbying activities? Yeah, I think that uh, your watch right, should not be used for, for lobbying. But most, most importantly, I think that lobbying does serve a useful purpose, but it's also true that uh, is an unfair game because clearly sort of uh, financial firms have much more power than the public interest. So the public interest always loses out in lobbying. Okay. I mean, we've heard uh, just, uh, I'll, I'll ask Ms. Minow, you look like you want to weigh in on this. Uh, thank you very much, Congressman. Uh, there is one point that I'd like to make. I would hope that the committee would take a look at Bethany McLean's article in Fortune magazine about Fannie Mae, because it wasn't just the lobbying. It was the fact that their foundation um, had events in all of the um, uh, congressional districts uh, that uh, for their oversight committee that I think played a very big role in it. So it, it's more than just lobbying. All right. Mr. Smith, do you think if we had stronger uh, shareholder representation on the board uh, so that the policies that were then being advocated by the company, uh, if we had those stronger shareholder representatives on board governance, uh, that would help address this issue? Absolutely. Um, I think that that's, that's the key to, to, it's really the solution because I think the, to cut off lobbying does, does right. isolate you and, and what we need to have is, is balanced uh, uh, opportunity to be heard by the, the interested parties and I think that's the piece that's lacking or has been lacking. Okay. Dr. Westcott, do you have anything to add to this? No. All right. Uh, the, you know, we've been asking a little bit about this uh, corporate pay an awful lot because it's the symbol of outrageous uh, excess and abuse. You know, Mr. Prince was in here before. He got $38 million when he walked away, uh, lost about $20 million, billion in two quarters. Mr. Mozilla of Countrywide, uh, another great American entrepreneur, uh, was given $120 million and he ran his company into the ground. Uh, Mr. O'Neill from Merrill Lynch got a walk-away package of $161 million. Uh, also in the last two quarters before he left, they lost about $20 uh, billion for the shareholders. And uh, all of us think that's a bit odd. Do you believe that there should be uh, a right of the taxpayers to have whatever rights would be available to the company to claw back some of that rip-off walk-away money in the event those companies choose to participate in this bailout? Yes. Mr. Zingali, Mr. Westcott? Yes. I mean, if the government is, is part owner of the firm, it should have the rights of a part owner. Okay. Mr. Wallison, how about you? Uh, yeah. If, the, if the, um, uh, the compensation was, in fact, not properly earned, 
shareholders, the company should be able to get it back. Yeah, and I, would we all basically agree that these guys got out of Dodge before the House of Cards collapsed? Yes. But it put in place the rot in the beams that led to its falling down. Yeah, Congressman, if, if a private entity were participating in some kind of a transaction involving distressed securities, they would insist on those rights, and the taxpayers should certainly insist on them as well. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Right. Welch. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Shays. Thank you, Mr. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I um, want to apologize. I'm going to make some reference to my statement. I had been hoping that I could do that earlier because it has context to the questions that I want to ask. I'd like to know your response to what I'm about to say. At the center of our financial crisis is the collapse of the housing market. So it's surprising to me we are not taking a close look at Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac. What is also glaringly missing from these hearings is an intense investigation about the role of Congress in this disaster, particularly as it relates to Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac. Together, these two giant financial institutions scrutinize half of our nation's $12 trillion mortgage market. <coughs> Clearly, Wall Street bears significant responsibility for this crisis. The leaders of these financial institutions need to explain how over-leveraging, over undercapitalization of peak accounting and minimal investor disclosure ever seemed like sound business practices. Every part of the financial market broke down. Wall Street accumulated far too much debt. Consumers lived on credit, often refinancing their homes to get it. Lenders lured buyers into houses they couldn't afford. Investment firms did not disclose the risks associated with their products. The rating agencies seemed oblivious to shaky financial instruments and the companies that bought and sold them. And the federal government, including Congress, failed to properly regulate. The regulatory structure was failing, and we in Congress refused to do anything about it. In the interest of truth, it must be said we are not confronting the 800-pound gorilla in the room. What we are not confronting is the role of Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac in this debacle. Combined, these two companies not only scrutinize half of the nation's mortgage market, but one trillion alone in subprime loans. Yet they are not required to disclose the risk these mortgages pose to the solvency of their balance sheets. Why? Because we in Congress have not required the same registration and reporting requirements of Fannie and Freddie as we do with all other publicly traded companies. The efforts of a few of us in Congress to address this situation are a matter of public record. Our efforts can be found in legislation, in hearings, in debates, in votes, in committee, and on the floor of the House. When it came to Fannie and Freddie, lobbyists effectively manipulated both sides of the aisle Fannie and Freddie hired lobbyists to advocate for their position and kept countless lobbyists on retainer to prevent them from arguing against their position. Congress stood idly by as Fannie and Freddie <coughs> played with trillions of dollars under a different set of rules with little capital to protect their balance sheets from sudden losses. There is no way to explain it. The reason, no other way to explain it. The reason we haven't scheduled hearings on these two institutions and haven't requested documents from either is because their demise isn't someone else's fault, it's ours, and we don't want to own up to it. Mr. Chairman, the alarm bells were sounded more than four years ago. I request the transcripts of these public discussions. I request the transcripts of the following committee and House debates be placed in the records for today's hearing. July 1, 23, 2002, Financial Services Committee hearing. OFEA, risk-based capital stress test for Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac. July 23, 2003, Financial Services Committee markup, H.R. 2420, the Mutual Funds Integrity and Transparency Act. September 25, 2003, Financial Services Committee hearing, H.R. 2575, the Secondary Mortgage Market Enterprises Regulatory Improvement Act, and the administration's proposals on GSE regulation. That was September 25, 2003. October 6, 2004, Financial Services Subcommittee hearing, the Affair Report, Allegations of Accounting and Management Failure at Fannie and Freddie. April 6, 2005, Financial Services Committee hearing, additional Fannie Mae failures. October 26, 2005, floor debate, consider Mr. Royce amendment to H.R. 4161 to strengthen the OFEO regula regulator. Getting to the bottom of this, uh, that's my motion that we uh, introduce these into the record. The gentleman 
would permit, uh, I would suggest that we make reference to all of those and uh, people then can link into those rather than spend taxpayers' money to reproduce all of, the, all of those uh, records, if that's acceptable that's to acceptable. you? That's acceptable. Then without objection, that will be the order. Getting to the bottom of this, whatever that takes, is our obligation, but requires us not just to look at CEOs of Lehman or AIG, but at ourselves and the, record, uh, the wretched manipulation by Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac of the Congress of the United States. Uh, with the limited time I have left, I would like I have no time left. If the gentleman uh, would permit and yield to me, uh, we have five hearings scheduled on the issues of where we are in the economy and what's happened with Wall Street. And the gentleman raises issues about Freddie Mac and Fannie Mae. Our staff is already looking into some of the documents relating to them, and we may well uh, uh, add additional hearings. We're not restricted to those uh, five hearings, and I appreciate the uh, concern that's been raised. Uh, would the gentleman yield? Yes, sir. Uh, given that your the mic, housing, your mic, your mic. Given that the housing market is what brought down everyone else, why wouldn't we start with Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, given they were exempted from the 1934 law, the 1933 law, and given that we all know that they hired lobbyists to work their will in Congress? Why would we not be looking at Congress? Why are we looking at everyone else but Congress? Well, I have no reason not to look at Congress. We'll be happy to look at Congress. It's been controlled by the Republican Party for the 12-year uh, period. And uh, during the two years the Democrats have been controlled, it's been controlled by a Republican administration. We ought to look at the politics of why we haven't gotten further. But trying to understand where we uh, uh, have been and where we are now and what the causes were and what reforms are necessary uh, is, uh, is the objective of this committee, and you can't do everything all at once. We'll start with the first hearing today, and we'll go on to the next one tomorrow, and we'll go on from there. Um, we uh, have completed all of the uh, members who sought recognition. Mr. Uh, Mr. Micah, Mr. You? Chairman, uh, given the importance of this hearing um, and uh, the, uh, again, asking for fairness for both sides, uh, I would ask unanimous consent that each side be given an additional 10 minutes uh, to be distributed by the chair and the acting ranking member uh, for additional questions of this panel. Uh, the chair is going to object to that. We've had a very long time with this panel and we have Mr. Fold waiting. But uh, the chair will note that there are many more Democratic members here than Republican members. And uh, I will allocate five minutes to the uh, Republicans between the two of you to uh, ask any further questions that you wish to uh, pursue of this group. Uh, who should control that time? Mr. I'll Shares. control it and yield to my colleague three minutes. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Well, I'm, uh, actually, I'm quite disappointed. Uh, uh, I was berated. I'd be happy to yield berate, my colleague five minutes. I was berated like. by the uh, chair um, in the bipartisan manner in which I conducted my subcommittees. I am the ranking member of the largest committee in Congress. I chaired the subcommittee, uh, aviation subcommittee for six years, never once denied a single Democrat or Republican, Republican the opportunity to fully participate uh, in, in offering an opening statement or asking a question. Um, I'm, I'm really, I'm, I'm really uh, saddened by the way this is being conducted because this is an important hearing, uh, and there are important questions that the uh, people want answered. Uh, and if he wonders why no, people aren't on this side, uh, if you can't participate, why, why the hell should you be here? But uh, that's another matter. I have a couple of questions in my remaining uh, time. So now that we have no major investment banks. Uh, Mr. Walson, what do we do in regulating them? <laughs> well, we <laughs> That's a rhetorical question. There's nothing to regulate at the moment. Okay. There uh, are 5,000 securities uh, firms, incidentally, um, all of which could become investment banks yeah. over time. But. Well, I, I think the things, some of the things that were raised here, transparency, leveraging, would you say that uh, by uh, Fannie Mae reducing its reserves from 10 percent to 2.5 percent, that, uh, the, that uh, others in the private sector, now people don't understand that the, we had a government-backed 
Securities Operation, which was Fannie Mae, and they were backed by, by the United States government. Lehman, AIG, and the others are private and were private investment uh, activities. Is that correct? Okay. Now, uh, not that they should be uh, precluded, but when you have ones reduce uh, their reserves, then what happens? Wall Street follows usually uh, to, to compete. Is, isn't that what happened? Is your mic on? Is your mic on? The, sorry. The capital of Fannie and Freddie were set by statute. That was one of the regulatory problems that are associated with those two enterpr enterprises. Well, again, my, my point, though, is that in most of this, uh, Wall Street followed. Now, of course, Reigns only took off with $100 million in compensation, and we have, uh, and that was a government sponsored activity. That's absolutely outrageous. Mr. Shays tried to bring that under uh, control. Uh, he introduced legislation. I was a co-sponsor in 2002. Then people in Congress, this, this, and we don't have Fannie, anyone from Fannie Mae here to start this out. This is, this is ridiculous. Fannie Mae, who was the biggest uh, uh, private mortgage lender in the country? Wasn't it countrywide, Mr. Wilson? Countrywide, yes. A countrywide, okay. How's this, uh, Mr. and Mrs. America? Uh, Franklin Raines received a 5.1 percent uh, loan for 10 years for almost a million dollars in refinancing. Jamie Gerlach received 5 percent for uh, $960,000 refinancing, both employees. This is a government activity, outrageous, and they walked away with, with millions of dollars, and we're not looking at that. Then the guy that writes the bailout package in the uh, Senate gets, uh, uh, he got one of these VIP countrywide mortgages for himself, and, and we're just trying to blame Wall Street. Is that, is, is that fair? I want and everyone to Well, admit, there's been greed fair? all around, I'd greed? say. Greed all around. Okay. And, uh, Was it greed, Mr. Smith? Or just a good deal for the, a few elected officials? And, uh, somebody behind a government mortgage company who uh, was was ripping folks off. I, I would certainly say it's not actions in the best interest of the shareholders. Ms. I think there are profound conflicts of interest, and I hope that there Mike. is. Sorry, I think there are profound conflicts of interest, and I hope that there is oversight of Fannie and Freddie Thank and you. Congress. Doctor, uh, plenty of blame to go around. The truth is that. Um, Fannie actually lost market share in some of these mortgage areas in the years in question. So to it's the not private sector competing with, right. trying to keep up with what the government was doing. Right, but, but Fannie was government losing market back share. Government activity was doing. Thank you. Yeah, Dr. conflict of interest are always dangerous wherever they are in Wall Street, in, in Congress, so in pol political position is always dangerous. How, how uh, uh, again, do you bring this under control? We'll go down the panel, uh, in the, given the cards that we're currently dealt. That's well, my question. There was, a, there was an excellent bill that came out of the Senate Banking Committee in 2005. That bill would have, con would have allowed an, a regulator to control their capital, which would have immediately reduced their risks, and, that was and controlled their portfolios, which are a major source of their risk. By a partisan vote? The that was a partisan voted vote. All Republicans Democrats voted for it. All Democrats it. voted and against it. And then who was chairman who, uh, at, or the, who, who was chairman, and then who blocked it as the ranking member? Gentlemen, time has expired. Excellent. Uh, chair will now uh, take his five minutes. And uh, I, I, th I don't think we ought to use these hearings as an opportunity to be partisan. Because Freddie and Fannie had uh, uh, people in charge when Clinton was president that got excessive salaries and bonuses. But so did Mr. Mudd, who was appointed by President Bush. But what we're starting to look at in, this, in these series of hearings of how we got into this mess is what's happened with one of the companies that has actually gone bankrupt and for which many people have told us this has started in a direct line to the $700 billion that the Congress has now approved uh, to uh, give to the Treasury to help stabilize our economy. Uh, 
To start off with, Lehman, I think, is perfectly appropriate. To look at Freddie Mac and Fannie Mae is also appropriate, and we should look at all of these issues. But what struck me from your presentation today, and I thank the panel very much for what you had to tell us, is that uh, there seems to be almost uh, no accountability to the people who own the corporations. They're the ones who own it, and they're the ones who take the loss when the company goes bankrupt. There seems to be no transparency in what's going on. It appears that the CEO controls the decisions with a board that's hand-picked in many circumstances, and it, that certainly appears to be the case with the Lehman Brothers. And the CEO can play with other people's money. And not just play with other people's money, he can borrow a lot of money to leverage the money he has to play with. And if, it, if uh, times are good, that leverage can bring in an enormous amount of profits. But if time is bad, then he can uh, lose his um, footing for his corporation very, very quickly. Uh, it does seem to me that pe ordinary people play by a different set of rules than they do on Wall Street. Because ordinary people in this country, have, many of them lost their jobs, have lost their homes, everyone's seen their health care costs go up, if they're lucky enough to have health care insurance. And if they're not, when they go to see a doctor or access the system, they know how expensive it all is, especially if they buy drugs. And if they fail in their jobs, they're held accountable. They don't get the promotions. Uh, they don't get the bonuses. And in fact, they can get fired. Even if they've done a good job, they get fired if the corporations run into troubles. But the CEOs seem to always come out on top. They win when the corporation wins, and they win when the corporation tanks. And, that, and there's something that's fundamentally troubling about that, because there's no accountability, and uh, there's no uh, consequence. So as we look at how to reform the system, I, I think we, we, we need more transparency on Wall Street. We have a vast explosion in new investments, complex uh, financial instruments like credit default swaps, derivatives, collateral, collateralized uh, debt obligations. There's no way for an investor to discipline firms that invest in these der derivatives because there's so little disclosure. And as I heard you, Mr. Smith, it's hard for you to do anything as a, representing a, a good number of investors to do anything about what a corporation's actions are because the corporation's so closed. Is that an accurate statement? Yes, it is. So I, I think as we look at how we got into this situation, we have to recognize that there have been people who've been able to play games with other people's money and never had to face the consequences themselves of failure. There's not enough transparency as to what they're doing. There's not enough control by even their shareholders. And the regulators are toothless, either because the laws don't allow them to regulate or they're just not regulating because they're uh, short on their budget or short on their commitment. So maybe we can say everybody's responsible, everybody's to be blamed, but I know one thing. The $700 billion is now going to be paid for by taxpayers in hopes that we, set, that we stabilize our financial markets. There's no guarantee that we're going to return to health right away. We hope we can do that. But what this committee is trying to do is to understand how we got into this situation and give some recommendations, not that we have the jurisdiction for other legislation, but to those committees that do have the jurisdiction to think through whether there ought to be a limit on, uh, on uh, the, uh, the, the amount of money that they could leverage. There ought to be limits on transparency. There ought to be limits on uh, shareholder, uh, limits on CEO pay, and whether there ought to be a lot more openness to shareholder uh, in influence in the companies that they presumably own. I thank you all very much for your presentation, and uh, we're going to now uh, uh, move on to the second panel, which will be Mr. Fold. Thank you. Thank you. Good to meet you. It was a pleasure. It was a pleasure. See you in Rome sometime. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, let's take a, uh, a few minutes in recess while this panel leaves, and then we're going to have Mr. Fold uh, take his place. Let's have a.
three minute, three minute break. Live from the Rayburn House office building, you're watching the first of five House hearings on financial market oversight. A short break uh, in this hearing now before testimony from uh, Lehman Brothers uh, Chairman and CEO Richard Fould. He's making his uh, first public appearance since his company filed for bankruptcy last month. We'll show you this hearing again, by the way, in its entirety tonight at 8 Eastern here on C-SPAN. Again, the first of five House hearings on financial market oversight. Tomorrow is day two when the focus will be on the federal intervention in AIG's problems. That's live.